Okay, everybody, um, welcome to uh, this special event, the special live stream with uh, Professor James B. Apple. Uh, to begin with, I'm gonna turn it over to Tsai Ling's director, Venerable Carol Karate, and she'll, uh, she'll get us started. So. My name is Carol Karate, and I'm the director of Tsai Ling Center. We're really happy to have you join us for this evening's program. Uh, Atisha Deepamkara, illuminator of the Awakened Mind with Professor James Apple. As you know, TCL has moved to uh, exclusive online programming uh, or moved to online programming in March of this year. It's been a challenging time for us all. And if you'd like to support this program and others like it, please consider making a donation at seichenlang.org. Just click on the donate here button. Our goal is to offer, is to continue to offer great programs like this one and eventually to get our, our doors open again um, after this crisis has passed. So it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Apple. James Apple is a professor of Buddhist studies at the University of Calgary and a leading expert on Atisha's life and teachings. A widely published author, he received his doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison under the tutelage of Geshe Lindup Sopa. Geshe Sopa introduced James to the works of Atisha during the summer of 1992. Professor Apple has devoted much of his own research and writings to examine the full range of Atisha's contribution to Buddhism. Tonight's talk will highlight two of James Apple's books, Jewels of the Middle Way and Atisha Deepamkara, Illuminator of the Awakened Mind. It's both a pleasure and a great honor to welcome Professor James Apple to the Sechen Ling Virtual Gompa. And now back to Stephen Butler, who will get the program started. Stephen. Thank you very much, Venerable Carol. Yeah, welcome to all of you who are joining in here in the Zoom room, but we have a number of people who are watching live on Facebook. We're all glad that you're here. Uh, from what I can see, we have people stretched all over North America and even going as far away as India. So that's wonderful. We're all glad you're here. Um, it is a really special event for us, um, and we're really honored to have Professor James B. Apple with us. Um, as uh, Venerable Carol mentioned, he's the author of two, I'll say newly published, because I think in the world of books, newly can, can mean sometimes three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, but certainly in light of the research that uh, Professor Apple has done, it's worthy to say that these are new, and you'll find out more about how new that is uh, how new this work is uh, once Professor Apple begins. But yes, as Venerable Carol mentioned, we'll be focusing primarily on these two published works, one published in 2019, which is uh, through Shambhala Publications, Atisha Dipankara, Illuminator of the Awakening Mind. And we'll also be touching upon themes in the broader work published through Wisdom Publications, Jewels of the Middle Way. We highly encourage you to, to look at these books. And I think you'll see um, that they, the research, um, the newly translated works, recently available works that are in there provide a unprecedented view um, into the life and thought of Atisha through Professor Apple's um, diligent and um, devoted um, work. Um, as you'll see, it's it's been a uh, uh, there's a long journey that's led um, uh, Professor Apple to these books, and um, he'll uh, share that with you. So along the lines of the journey, um, it's uh, very much uh, that. Um, as I was talking to somebody at Sei Chen Ling uh, uh, just yesterday, I, I said there's, there's a little bit of Indiana Jones in this um, because there's um, there are tales of lost texts, there are tales of um, uh, secret meetings in the middle of the jungles of the Indian subcontinent between a youthful teacher, a youthful student and teachers. It's a story of journeys uh, going very, very far away, arduous journeys to obtain secret teachings and obtain teachings from authentic gurus. Um, and then finally culminating with a, a very arduous journey over the Himalayas, very late in life, may I add, um, uh, by Atisha as he comes to Tibet. Um, I won't get into too much, but obviously what we know of Atisha is largely through the Tibetan corpus of work. 
And as James Apple will be sharing with us, that corpus has greatly increased in recent years. Uh, a very personal, uh, uh, a little another anecdote. Uh, you'll also be learning uh, an interesting fact about tea. So tea drinkers pay attention to that because you'll hear a little bit about that in the course of this discussion. And most importantly, as we all know as Tibetan Buddhists in the world of Tibetan Buddhism, quite often there are discussions of teacher and student. And that's kind of where this journey begins. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Apple. Um, we're just so grateful to have you here and uh, um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Venerable Carol. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I, I wanna thank everyone uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak on these works. And I, I hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy. And uh, as St Stephen mentioned, I want, I'd like to start off uh, just by mentioning my uh, main teacher, Geisha Sopala. Um, there's a picture of him from Wisconsin as I, um, Geisha Sopala was my main teacher. Uh, he was one of two Tibetan, at the time, uh, he was one of two Tibetan tenured professors in US academia. So he wore both the hat of, U.S. Acad uh, academic, and then also he was a very pre prestigious Kalupa monk. Uh, he oversaw 33 PhDs at Wisconsin. Uh, I did not finish under him, but I did uh, do my PhD, majority of my PhD training under him, and I certainly trained under Geshe Sopala for around 14 years, from around 1992 to 2002 or so. Uh, I first met him in 1992 at a retreat in Deer Park. I wrote many letters when I was an undergraduate. And, and, and so instead of going to like Florida during spring break, I went to Deer Park and stayed in a monastery. And that's where I first learned about Atisha. Um, he introduced me to Atisha English translation. And then I wound up go, going back to Wisconsin in 1996, uh, in the 1993. And then we read Atisha's life story in 1996 in second year Tibetan. And then here you can see here, he's in a class uh, teaching survey of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and this is in 1996. And as you can see on the blackboard is written the word Atisha. And he was very enthusiastic about Atisha. And of course, then we read in 1997 in third year Tibetan, we read the open basket of jewels. Uh, the Ratnakaranda Utgata Majamaka Upadesha Shastra, which was written by Atisha. And that was in 1997. And that's actually the first chapter of Jules and also the, uh, one of the main chapters, beginning chapters in Illuminator. And so at that time, uh, I was you know, more interested in Tsongkhapas, Losong Drakpa. So I went on to do other research and other things. And then uh, when I finally came here to Calgary, uh, uh, next slide, or the slide on uh, collected works of the Kadampas, uh, these manuscripts began to be open to the public. And these were what are known as the collected works of the Kadampas. And uh, I wanna mention here a little bit about these manuscripts because this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And uh, as you can see here, they're, they were actually you know, rather stored for over 300 years untouched. And so, Five out of seven chapters in Jewels is from manuscripts of these collected works of the Kadampas. Six out of 14 chapters in Illuminator are from these manuscripts. And so I explain in the uh, preface to Jewels in the Middle Way about uh, these um, uh, manuscripts. And so they, these were brought together in 2002 under the direction of Tukta Nima, and, I, uh, who, uh, and he was the one that brought them together. And so uh, as one French scholar recently uh, mentioned, uh, these are as, as important as the Dong Wang findings uh, for Buddhist studies. Uh, and so uh, if we can go back a couple of slides to the uh, how they're stacked loosely, right? Uh, you know, these original manuscripts are actually from a temple in Drepung. Uh, just a couple more slides back, please. Uh, the Drepung, uh, Drepung uh, Monastery has a temple called the Nechung Lakhang. 
uh, just a couple more slides back. Uh, uh, one more. Yes, right here. So this Drepung Lakang, uh, this is this temple of the 16 Arhats. And so this may, uh, was a part of the great vast libraries in, of Drepung Monastery in Tibet. And so these manuscripts were actually conf uh, confiscated during the time of the fifth Dalai Lama at around 1642. And so they've been untouched for over since the 17th century for over you know, 250 years at least. Uh, and so they, 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 they somehow survived. You know, not all libraries in Tibet survived. That is, they didn't survive the Mongols and, uh, invasion and they didn't survive various other invasions and they didn't survive the communist revolution. But these particular manuscripts in this Neitrung Lakhang, the 16 Arhats temple, uh, survived intact. And in fact, 80%, uh, so if we go ahead to a, a couple of slides forward here, 80%, uh, so you can see the team, uh, I'm sorry, go one back, please. The, here you can see teams of Tibetans who are going through folio by folio to place them in the right order, okay, or what they perceive to be the right order. And then on the right here, we see the final uh, bookshelves were built, they were put together and so forth. Uh, one more slide forward, please. And so here we can see an actual facsimile reproduction. So 80% of these manuscripts, uh, of the Kadampa manuscripts, of which I'm drawing from the most, what I consider to be the most important, which is uh, these early works of Atisha and some of his earlier followers. Uh, here we actually see the uh, manuscript, a picture of the manuscript itself. So these texts were basically saved from oblivion. And as I stay, stated in Jules, it get, uh, in the preface on around page 13, I quote, it gives pause for thought that these manuscripts are available to scholars today through the sheer contingency of historical factors that have enabled their recovery. And this is what I really kind of dealt with underneath while I'm working on this, is it's the sheer contingency of things uh, that some of these manuscripts would not even be known to history uh, unless they were recovered and brought out. And, um, and here, uh, one slide forward, please. Uh, I, uh, here we see a manuscript facsimile example. So this is an example that's taken from the shelves in my office. And this is uh, of what a text called Kulo Tsawa's treatise on the distinguishing the Swatantraka Prasangika distinction in early 12th century Tibet. I published this in 2018. And so I've so far edited uh, seven uh, manuscripts and published them line by line going through. And so what happens is, is you find out is that all these, uh, the Tibetans in Lhasa and Drepung, they worked very diligently to uh, stack and organize the best they could and so forth. But even then, sometimes if, unless the text has been edited, the folios are out of place or there's a folio missing or even the scribal, even if they've, put them together correctly, the scribe who copied them might not have been fully literate. And sometimes there's a lot of errors there. So uh, in my view, of course, I'm a scholar, so I view uh, editing and organizing these uh, texts as a very important activity. Uh, and here we see the next uh, slide. Uh, the uh, one more. Um, all right. Yeah, these are now here's on the other side of these bookshelves over here. We have 120 of these. Uh, this is the best folio, uh, photo I could get. Uh, and so some, uh, I've, I, have, I have not read all the, all the volumes here, okay? I've looked through a majority of them. Uh, as I said, I've edited about uh, eight works out of these, not eight volumes, but eight works. You know, each volume probably contains 10 to 12 works. And um, there's only about five, libraries that I know of in North America that has this collection. So, and maybe this might be one of only two in Canada. So I was very fortunate in 2008 or nine, around 2010, I believe, to order these uh, from a good scholar uh, in Germany and um, had them sent. So I, I, these were based on grant funds. So I'm very thankful to the taxpayers of Alberta that allowed me to research these uh, materials because they're, 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 they're quite rare. 
And uh, one, one slide forward, please. And, and so here we see uh, volume 91. And this is the first volume of the fourth set. So the last set was 91 to volume 120. And this contains the uh, Jungchub Lamgi uh, Rimpa, the Bodhipatta Krama, the stages of the path in chapter 12 of Illuminator. So uh, here we have the next, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So <laughs> now here for your eyes only, that I've, I've only shown my dear wife is an amulet that protects, this is a protective amulet for those who are practicing the Lam Rim of Atisha. This is a, a facsimile reproduction of a work that's found within these stages of the path cycle. And this is called, this is a commentary on enhancing practice and removing obstacles. And so here we see two protection wheels against obstacles in the uh, Lam Rim or stages of the path system. So this is the Lam Rim Gekselgi Sung Kor Ni, the two protection wheels of removing obstacles to the practice of Lam Rim. And this is with a, you know, and, and we have, oh, today we're going to talk about Illuminator and Jewels. I'm finishing right now, the third of the trilogy is the stages of the path and its commentaries. And so I thought I would show that here. Uh, now, then, uh, I'd like to move on to finally get to talking about uh, the life of Atisha. And so here we see uh, Tonka. <laughs> and it turns out that the, this Tonka here will illustrate many of the important uh, episodes in Atisha's life. And so I was considering putting this into the book, but then it would, it would have delayed the book greatly. So I withheld. And then uh, as I studied, uh, I've continued to study since Illuminator has been published. And it turns out that there's multiple types of this uh, episodes being reproduced in these Tonkas. There's, and the, but there's only two or three that survive, or at least are publicly available. Uh, and so here I've taken this one from HimalayanArt.com as I'll show. And so in the Illuminator, uh, the biography of Atisha, I, I use the, as Helmut Eimer, the great German scholar, has uh, investigated. There are over 40 sources on the life of Atisha. Uh, and actually, a number of them are preserved here in other volumes. Uh, one volume here I have uh, separately has some of the earliest. And so I chose the two earliest ones. That is the extension, extensive biography of Ja Dutzen Sunjumbar who lived in the 11th century. And then also the Chim Namkadraks, the universally known, which was a, he, Chim Namkadrak was a, a great abbot of Nartong Monastery, which was a Kadampa institution. And so these are the two earliest um, historical uh, biographies of Atisha. Now there's one, <laughs> there's one in Bhutan or a, a lama in Bhutan, or has been preserved in Bhutan, that a lama wrote, compiled, I think he compiled everything you could ever, all, everything you could ever know about Atisha. It's about 550 folios long. And I would still be translating it here today. It, it would take years to do. Some, uh, a particular lama, he accumulated every known uh, little gossip or legend about Atisha. But I didn't do that. I wanted to go to the earliest sources. And so, the one by Dulzen Sunjumbar was done uh, or composed uh, about 50, uh, 50 to 60 years after Atisha lived. So it's not too far away. And it obviously carries a number of oral traditions of Atisha. Uh, and so I've tried to co coordinate some of the major episodes here with uh, these paintings. So uh, here we can go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, and so here we see uh, he's a youth, Atisha was the second of three sons uh, named Chandagarbha. Uh, he was very inclined to Buddhism from a very early age. Uh, his father uh, taught him uh, the, some esoteric Buddhism and his mother was also affiliated with uh, the Vedas. So he uh, was at least born in the upper classes or if not a Kshatriya. Uh, the Tibetans will, of course, call him Joe O.J. because of the princely lord, uh, because of his stature. Um, and the next slide, please. And so here we see uh, it, early on, he's getting trained by either Bodhibhadra or Vijakokula. And these are uh, 
he, Atisha initially studied at Vikramala Shila Monastery, and then he moved on to Nalanda, which is traditionally thought to be the world's oldest university out uh, in comparison with Oxford. And uh, Nalanda is being rejuvenated even to this day. And so here, uh, the young princely Chandragarbha, future Atisha, uh, he learns the awakening mind, Bodhicitta, initially from uh, Bodhibhadra, he actually takes refuge under a figure named Jitari. And then Vidya Kokila, the name we see here, uh, was also a Majamaka master. And so Atisha becomes very much affiliated with the lineage of the middle way or middle way practice of Majamaka of Nagarjuna. And this will be very important throughout his life, particularly when he goes to Tibet. And uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and so here we see um, his most influential teacher when he was a young man, uh, before he becomes ordained, is going to be uh, Avadutipa. And here, as I mentioned in Jules, there's about four or five figures named Avadutipa, and he seems to be uh, definitely, he's no longer, it's not a monk here, he's a tantric yogin. And this tantric yogin, uh, Avaduti is the central channel in the esoteric body. So he was a master of this type practice, but he was also a master of Majamaka. And so Atisha, his lineage of Majamaka comes down through Avadutipa, which I've uh, very much uh, documented in Jules. And also, it, uh, even though Avadutipa seems to be this tantric yoga, yogi Siddha figure, he very much stresses the maintenance and following of cause and effect, of karmic cause and effect. Uh, effect. And in fact, he tells Atisha, unless you understand subtle selflessness, you must pay attention to karmic actions of body, speech, and mind. And then I think that type of impression will uh, be with Atisha at, once he becomes ordained and then uh, certainly when he goes to West Tibet. Uh, and so here we have uh, the next slide, please. Ah, now here, so in his youth, I think around the age 21 to 28, um, Atisha uh, goes from Avidutipa and he actually receives consecration into the esoteric practice of Havajra, uh, which is a very uh, Yogi Nirutara Tantra, it's a high level Tantra uh, that involves a lot of uh, this kind of wrathful uh, deity, Haruka Havajra, who uh, kind of is historically related to or competing with Shaiva groups. And so this Havajra is actually a very kind of fierce deity, but also uh, is thought to uh, be very conducive to very quick awakening. So here uh, he receives this consecration, uh, Rahula Gupta gives it to him over 13 days. And then Atisha takes up the life of a, of a tantric yogin in India. Uh, so this uh, involves a whole number of secret practices. And here we can see some of the yogis and yoginis uh, dancing and so forth, uh, you know, demonstrating this kind of uh, esoteric Buddhist yogic behavior that, uh, that he actually, Atisha, took up for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, the next slide, please. Uh, then Atisha, uh, as a document in the book, uh, he gets uh, several different visions, right? He has a vision of Maitreya uh, who does not let, let him go into a certain area of a temple. Uh, he has another in, uh, vision of Shakyamuni. And then he also, had, I believe, you know, gets a, a vision from the goddess Tara that he should become a monk. And so uh, at the age of 29 or so, 28, 29, Atisha becomes a monk and he becomes a monk in the lineage of the Mahasangikas. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the greater community of what, and so as I mentioned in the book, this is, uh, Atisha's life is a rare example of a Mahasangika monk because the Mahasangikas don't, do not survive history. Even though they were very prevalent in India at one time, we do not actually have a full Vinaya or, or, or ordination code preserved in Sanskrit of their ordination lineage, the Vinaya monastic code of the Mahasangikas. So this will affect Atisha when he goes to Tibet because uh, from the time of uh, his predecessors, we'll see the Tibetans mostly follow the Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya of Shantarakshita, which was established in the uh, eighth, late eighth century under Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila. And so here we see Atisha 
after he receives um, ordination into the Mahasangika, uh, he begins to study and have activities at Bogaya, the place, you know, Dorji Dan, the place where the Buddha was awakened, and then Vipramalashila Monastery. Uh, and so here, uh, next slide, please. And so here we see the archaeological remains of uh, Vikramalashila. Um, and we don't know much uh, about it, but at least this location seems to be, uh, this district in Bihar seems to have been identified as Vikramalashila. And this is where Atisha resided and was one of the main disciplinarians there. Uh, so the next slide, please. The, so. When Atisha then, while he's at uh, Vikramalashila and he's uh, you know, learning, studying, he studies, he, he's a lifelong, Atisha, one thing about Atisha is he's a lifelong learner. So he's learning Abhidharma, uh, that is you know, higher Dharma of uh, kind of philosophy, psychology, cosmology. He's also, he learns various Vinaya codes or the, the, the four uh, popular ones there supposedly. And he also trained or he's, he kind of, I think, uh, learns a little bit about some of his colleagues, but he has an interest in learning about bodhicitta, the awakening mind. And so as he circumambulate, uh, and there's actually a text where or I should say a new a text related to Tara here that I should, I'll mention that uh, is actually called the uh, cycle of prophecies of texts related with Tara. So Atisha is guided by Tara throughout his life, you know, the saviors. And so one of the emanations of Tara, uh, when he's circulating at, at Bodh Gaya, the main temple there, supposedly the statue tells, when he he's meditating on her, she tells him, you, you, you need to go learn about the bodhicitta, the awakening mind. And then also he's uh, walking around a wall uh, area that was supposedly built by Nagarjuna. And two women are, are over her talking. And uh, one of them says, well, what's the quickest way to attain awakening? And one of them says, well, you must cultivate bodhicitta, this awakening mind, the altruistic awakening mind of love and compassion. So this spurs Atisha then to start investigating who is a great teacher for uh, this awakening mind that I can learn from, this you know, classical Mahayana type doctrine. And so asking around, he learns about this figure he, he refers to as Saralingpa uh, or Dharmakirti Sri. And I mentioned in the book, right, that this Dharmakirti Sri seemed as kind of a mysterious figure, but he maybe in his youth had actually studied earlier uh, in Bodh Gaya and in the India, and then went back to present day Sumatra and was involved as a king's chaplain, as it were. So Atisha, along with 125 Mahasangika monks, they go on a perilous journey, uh, 13th month journey from Bangla, or where we see present day Bangladesh down to roughly right around uh, where it, sa it says Singapore on this modern map. And they encounter all kinds of obstacles and so forth. Um, this area, uh, Sumatra, and uh, Atisha finally makes it after he actually calls upon several different esoteric Buddhist deities, uh, such as Tara, and then he might finally winds up using uh, Rakta Yamari, this red uh, Yamari, fierce deity to subdue this obstacle, you know, sea monster that was depicted as a uh, emanation of Shiva. <laughs> but in any case, they make it to Sumatra, and he's actually he's there for twelve. The teacher's there for twelve months before he's able to meet uh, Serlingpa. And then in the accounts, what we hear is that Atisha learns all the classical Mahayana um, scriptures from Serlingpa, uh, this Dharma Kirti Sri. He learns first of all the what's called the ornament for clear realization. Uh, this text stayed here in 15 sessions, so it could have been a year-long course, perhaps, in the uh, what's known as the Abhisamaya Alamkara. This is actually studied in Tibetan monasteries for five to seven years, this ornament for clear realization. But then Atisha also learns a whole number of other uh, teachings, particularly about exchanging oneself and others, a very secretive teaching among the Kadampas. Uh, certainly, he's then trained in the early teachings of 
uh, bo uh, bodhicitta, and also lo what will become known as lojong, or mind purification, or mind training. Uh, he, he receives two cycle of teachings, uh, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons, and uh, another that, uh, that is mentioned in Geshe Sopa's book, The uh, Peacock and the Poison Grove, right? Uh, I helped transcribe that book by Geshe Sopa Law. And this is uh, two cycles of mind training teachings uh, related that, uh, to Atisha, uh, which Atisha picked up while he was in Sumatra. Uh, and all, so he uh, learned also a Tara, right? Uh, Tisha uh, gained a lot of um, Tara practice uh, from um, Serlingpa, Dharmakirti Sri, and also Wrathful Ganapati. So no one, I don't think anybody studied or published that one yet, but there's a uh, practice called of wrath, you know, the uh, elephant, uh, de headed deity Ganapati Ganesha. Uh, there's actually a wrathful one that Atisha learned, uh, kind of a protective one that Atisha learned while he was in Sumatra. So uh, after studying there, uh, I think for a number of years, then he comes back to uh, Bodh Gaya. And here we have the next slide, please. And um, he's working, or uh, it seems to be working in uh, Vikamala Shila or Bodh Gaya and Vikamala Shila. And, and here we see in the Tonka, which is mentioned in Illuminator, that there was a warring factions between two kings, Neapala and Karna. And uh, Atisha, uh, there was actually several people killed. A monk was killed as well. And so Atisha worked as a peacemaker to uh, bring uh, appeasement to this conflict. And he was no noted for as being a peacemaker. Uh, the next slide, please. And uh, so here then Atisha, uh, this shows then he settles in, Atisha show, uh, settles into Vikramala Shila, right? So Atisha is appointed at Vikramala Shila and also perhaps Adantapuri and maybe uh, another monastery as a kind of preceptor uh, and he is known for discipline, right? So as I, I think I mentioned in the Illuminator, he's a, he holds the keys. So a dorm will have up to 20 monks and you know, Atisha had you know, 20 to 22 keys. He was, so he was renowned for discipline ethical, moral discipline. And, uh, and this is perhaps what impressed the Tibetans. This is why they are wanting to invite him to West Tibet is to restore some order uh, to the chaos going on uh, after the, uh, in the West Tibet. And so here, what we see on the left is, I believe the, to, uh, as, you'll, as, a, in the, as I mentioned in the jewels or as an illuminator, I should say, there's several different uh, trips of Tibetan monks to invite Atisha with gold, but he refuses several times. And so there are two monks, that is, um, Gya Sundru Singe, who was a lay person actually, and then uh, Sutram Gawa Natso Lotsawa. These two monks, or I should say one monk and one lay person, translators, they, were, they came to invite Atisha, and this is what I believe we see here on the left, is they're meeting with Atisha and asking to invite him to West Tibet. And he refuses, actually, right? Uh, Atisha refuses. Uh, I think he says something like, um, you know, I, don't, I have no need for gold, but if I had bodhicitta, I would actually go, but I haven't really fully developed it yet. You know, this altruistic intention to help others. Uh, and so then uh, the one party sent back, and in fact, Gya Sutra, uh, Sutram Singe is you know, devastated. Uh, this Because the trip to, to, from West Tibet to become La Shila is very perilous for Tibetans. In fact, the number of Tibetans died in this journey. It was a great sacrifice to try to bring Atisha to West Tibet. And Atisha realized this. And so uh, I think on the third request, Atisha actually tells uh, Natsu, Lotawa, and Gyasu, and uh, I'll consider this, I'll, but let me consult with my, you know, my deity, Tara. And so he consults with Tara, and then Tara gives him prediction uh, that you will be very beneficial if you, it will be very beneficial to people if you go to Tibet. However, uh, your lifespan will be shortened. That is, rather than if you stay in India, your life will be, you will leave to be 92. But if you go to Tibet, you're like, you only be, you'll only live to be 72. So Atisha took this into consideration. And then because 
uh, it was of great benefit. And at least as the story goes, it was of great benefit. He uh, made the decision to go. Now here, uh, researching these manuscripts, um, what comes out in the manuscripts, the Kadam manuscripts, some of these, and it's not, I didn't necessarily put this in the book, but this is in some of the other public article publication, is that there seems to have been a conflict between Atisha and his colleagues at Vikram Lashila, because Atisha had learned all this Majamaka Nagarjuna lineage in his youth, and also from his other teachers at Nalanda. And when he goes to Vikram Lashila, a number of his teachers are a Yogachara or mind only followers, and they're very much into pramana, this establishment of valid cognition. And as Atisha, as his works, you know, valid cognition for Atisha was only useful to refute non Buddhist opponents or even Buddhist opponents, but not, it doesn't have utility for realizing uh, reality and soteriological effic efficacy for removing afflictions and so forth. So I think Atisha was very much, you know, uh, influenced by these devoted Tibetans, right? And here, you know, Tibet was considered to be on the outskirts of the Indian Buddhist world, as it were, but they were you know, very devoted Buddhists. And they were also very much into Majamaka, or at least Atisha thought, you know, this middle way thought. So this kind of opportunity, I think Atisha uh, wanted to take advantage of. And so uh, he thought it over and then he uh, received this prophetic indication from Tara. And he told them, though, you got to wait 18 months. <laughs> so they still had to hang around for 18 months. And yet they, uh, so then uh, Natsu and Suchumgawa, or Suchumgawa and Surnam Singe, Gyasuch and Singe, they translated a number of works. So Atisha's um, entry to the two realities, the Satya Dwaya Avatara was translated in Tibet, or I should say in Vikram Lashila, as well as a commentary to it and several other works. So there were uh, also the Open Basket of Jewels was one of the first main works that was composed in India by Atisha and translated in the very temple of Vikram Lashila. Uh, the next slide, please. So here then, oh, well, uh, the next slide was uh, uh, Atisha then goes out on the journey, right? Uh, and so they set out uh, on an elephant and uh, I forgot to look up the Tibetan name, but here, or the, here it translates as admir admirable to see this beautiful elephant and their party sets out uh, a whole entourage. He brings with him a whole number of people. Uh, and then the uh, next slide, please. The, we see uh, here, I kind of roughly drew a rough course map of his journey, three years journey to Tibet. And um, yeah, there's just no way that I could have done, I, I'm not 60 yet, but you know, that'll be down the road if I, hopefully I can make it that way old. But yeah, here he is at the age of 60 riding on an elephant. And I don't know if you've ever been on the back of an elephant, but anyway, it's... <laughs> interesting you could say to say the least but he's 60 years old on elephant and horseback going three years to be Kamala Sheila here all the way up to uh, Toling in West Tibet and it's quite a journey and so here we can see the first stage is be Kamala Sheila to roughly around Kathmandu and then they'll be outside of Kathmandu and then they go from Kathmandu uh, the second leg goes up to a place called Mongyul which was uh, Lotsawa's, uh, Lutsa, or Nak, uh, Natsu Lotsawa's um, homeland. And then they go from Mangyul to uh, Toling in West Tibet. Uh, so the uh, next slide, please. So along the way on this three year uh, journey, they actually uh, debate a number of Buddhists. And so this is a depiction of him uh, debating non-Buddhists on the frontier lands of which he supposedly defeated them all. And so actually here, it's rather interesting is at this stage, at least in this stage of Indian, uh, pre-modern Indian history, the main adversaries uh, to Buddhism at this time are gonna be non-Buddhist, uh, you know, Hindu and you know, non-Hindu groups, the yogis and so forth. And so here we see an example of them debating. Uh, he supposedly defeats them and then gives them umbrellas or they give him umbrellas and compassion. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so then he makes a, uh, Tisha makes his way to Nepal, and here they uh, he establishes a kind of a, a relationship with the king, and then he builds a monastery or has commissioned a monastery to be built there, which is still standing to this day. 
in a certain part of Kathmandu. And so he entrusts his elephant to the Nepalese king. As long as the Nepalese king agrees that the elephant will be used to build a monastic institution or monastic uh, Buddhist uh, institution and not um, used for work or other types of work. Uh, and so here, this is what we see uh, in this image. Now, uh, let's see the next image then, please. So he leaves away, Atisha leaves away behind the elephant. And then uh, what I left out here is when they, they go outside of Kathmandu, and as Stephen mentioned earlier, there's actually a, wel a, a pre-welcoming uh, committee before this point uh, where they establish uh, right outside of Kathmandu uh, in Nunakot or this area where they uh, have a central throne and then they have uh, Nepalese and Indians on one side and Tibetans on another. And then they, uh, the Tibetans sing all these lovely songs. And then they offer a tea, uh, tea to Atisha. And uh, supposedly here he had not, this is the first instance of an Indian, known instance of an Indian drinking tea. And um, they have to explain, the Tibetans explain to him what it is. That uh, it's like a tree, but you can squeeze, you can't eat the, you can only eat the tree, you squeeze the juice and then it, it gives you an uplifting feeling. And so Atisha was very much impressed by this tea. And um, I should, I didn't include it, but he actually has a, po I, somewhere in my, files, there's a uh, praise of Atisha. He has this 34 praises of tea, all the miraculous qualities of tea. It helps you think fast and talk and recite quickly, very prayers. And, you know, there's all this, you know, positive things about tea. Of course, then later on, he'll say all these ne same negative things about alcohol, but, you know, tea, tea seems to be on the favored list here. And um, also at that point, they give him this horse, uh, and so um, here we see an image of that horse, right? That horse. So this horse has a, you know, all these uh, lovely uh, saddle and br bridle and so forth, uh, you know, re uh, representing the best of horse culture within you know, Tibetan culture. And so they go on their way from uh, Mongyul uh, up to uh, Purong and on to uh, uh, Toling. And so here we see an image of when they meet the royal monk, uh, Zhangjab E. So Zhangjab E is the Tibetan monk king who royal or monk royal figure who invites Atisha to Tibet. And you can see in the upper left are these special horns, which I think these horns are well known in Tibetan culture, but supposedly they were invented uh, for this or created just for this ceremony of, of Atisha coming to uh, West Tibet. And so I believe in the biography that they're, they're called the, uh, you know, horns for panditas and scholars or something like this, or horns for panditas and yogis for welcoming them. And so uh, here we see Atisha coming into West Tibet. And notice here as well, he's levitating above the seat. So what you'll see in Atisha's life is, is that Atisha is a con an accomplished siddha, a, a, a tantric yo a yogi, a siddha, an ascetic tantric yogi who has accomplished the supersensory powers and so forth. And he doesn't really ever explicitly show them, but he's also in the guise of a scholar. So he's like the scholar siddha. And so even in the earliest um, biographical sources, it shows Atisha or will mention Atisha attaining uh, certain uh, high level attainment. So here he's depicted as uh, levitating above the horse saddle. So he's not affected by the up, you know, the bumpy ride and so forth. And this will also be mentioned in other little sections of the biography, these little super sensory type events. Uh, the next slide, please. So Atisha then settles in a certain um, temple within the great monastic, West T Tibet monastic, uh, area of tolling. And then uh, while he's there, he, uh, the, the biographies depict him here as meeting with Rinchen Zongpo. Now, supposedly Rinchen Zongpo uh, is about somewhat older than Atisha, around 20, 20, 20, 20, 30 years older than Atisha. And so here we see their meeting. Uh, this is a very important teaching point given in the Illuminator, uh, roughly 39 to 43 about their meeting. And actually, Actually, they had been communicating via letter 
Uh, there's a very uh, important set of teachings that haven't been published yet, which I used for some of my previous work. And I don't think I, I might have mentioned them in Jules and Illuminator, but these letters uh, get, are letters of high level uh, synthesis of completion stage esoteric Buddhist practices that Atisha wrote for Rinchen Zongpo. And then those teachings were only uh, conveyed through this uh, figure named Chakriwa, who was a teacher or uh, was thought to be a teacher of Gampopa. So that lineage of teach, this, this is what some of the Kadampa uh, manuscripts unfolded was the copies of that set of teachings that uh, they're called the view and meditation, the Tagon Chimmo. Uh, and so here uh, we see this meeting with uh, Rinchen Zongpo, who is a great translator and practitioner of him in and of himself. He established, uh, Rinchen Zongpo established many temples in West Tibet. Uh, he lived to be almost a hundred years old. Uh, and in fact, when he's meeting with Atisha, he might've been around 85 to 87 years old. And Atisha instructs him, right? You know, even though you think you're old, you should continue being very one pointed and you have this precious human opportunity and you should take full advantage of it. Uh, and so, uh, here we see the uh, their meeting. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, then, uh, so Atisha actually spent several years in Tibet, or uh, uh, in Toling, translating a number of works, right? And then uh, he's he's agreed uh, to go back to become a Sheila after three years. So before he goes back, though, uh, there's a Upasaka, Atara had predicted that a Upasaka or lay person would become his foremost disciple. And so Atisha was always on the lookout for this foremost disciple, uh, Jongtunpa, Jongtun uh, Gawe Jungne, who was a, well, a, a lay person, but was educated in Eastern Kham, Denma, this uh, area of Eastern Kham. In some of the class, he was part of the teachings that continued after the collapse of the Tibetan Empire that was reestablished in both West and East Tibet. And so when uh, John Tarnpa heard about Atisha coming to West Tibet, he was one of the first ones to go out to try to meet him. And so here we, uh, and also Atisha, when he was uh, wandering around he, uh, after being at Toling, but they're still in Tibet, he was always wondering when this this prophecy of Tara is going to come true about meeting um, my, this Upa, special Upasaka layperson. And so then Atisha was out in the countryside teaching and in the entourage, in the entourage following him around was Jontanpa. And supposedly they, they met and immediately talked in the countryside there. And then they went back and uh, Atisha had actually prepared a boss for initiation. And so they spent the night in Atisha's quarters and then uh, Atisha uh, consecrated him in, uh, consecrated him with a boss. Now, what's interesting here is, is that uh, after I had completed these books, a, a, there's a, a young scholar who's worked on the history of a, another manuscript that was recovered on the history of Raiding. And so the Raiding will be the first monast Kadampa monastery established by Drontanpa. And there's a kind of biography of John Tumpa and Atisha there. And so in that history, which I was not able to include in the book, the books, it's, it says here that Atisha actually consecrated him into the practice of Guya Samaja. So uh, that's according to this uh, one older history. And so that's what we see here is some type of consecration by of, of the boss uh, with John Tumpa, who is very famous for having long hair and this occurred in Purong. And so right after they uh, met in Purong, uh, Natsu found out that the road to Nepal was blocked, that there was a, the way back to India was blocked because of a war conflict. And so then John Tampa, uh convinced Atisha that he should go to central Tibet and see uh, all the wonderful Sanskrit manuscripts in Samye Monastery that he should, there's lots of monks, there's all kinds of things that they could do if he went to central Tibet. And so then Atisha thought about this and um, said that he would, he would agree to go if he received a letter of invitation. 
So then Atish, uh, Duntampa wrote this letter of invitation, and it's about 19 verses long, I believe. It's partly been edited or studied by Helmut Eimer. And uh, there's a recently uh, recovered biography of Duntampa in which the full letter is included. And so I mentioned the letter and the, the jewels and illuminator, but I didn't translate it. It's a little bit, uh, it mentions a lot of you know, proper names and things. But it was addressed to all these main figures and benefactors in central uh, Tibet, the provinces of U and Thang. And so uh, they agreed to bring Atisha to uh, central Tibet. And then likewise at that time, the uh, Bodhipata Pradipa uh, was, the messengers sent, were sent to India to inform Ratnakarashanti and the uh, administrators of Vikramalashila that due to conflict, the teacher couldn't return to Tibet. But they brought, they supposedly copied on three sheets of paper this uh, lamp for the path to awakening. The, I believe it's chapter 12 or so in the Illuminator, the very famous work, the most famous work of Atisha's on three sheets of paper. And so the scholars there saw it and they realized that, well, Atisha would never have composed such a thing if he was had stayed in India. So this, uh, him staying in Tibet was of great benefit, that it, even though it was quite hard and that he had been teaching and translating in West Tibet, he was of great benefit by composing this Bodhipata Pradipa. And so they uh, released uh, Nakso from his burden of maintaining the three-year agreement. And then, so then Atisha and Jantampa and the entourage went from West uh, Purong area into U and Tsang. Uh, so the next slide here. Uh, now, on their way then, uh, you have uh, this other figure who was not included in the letter. So this letter that John Tumpo wrote, uh, and this uh, a figure that was a name was not included, was Kudun Sundru Yungdrum, who was an aristocratic monk who was also trained in eastern Tibet and then had his own monasteries, as we'll see. And so uh, he was a very proud monk, supposedly, and he had some type of conflict with Juntumpa. And so this is what's very interesting about the early Tibetan histories of Atisha's life, is they preserve his vicissitudes, his ups and downs, and the conflicts between the various clan groups and uh, regional affiliated figures uh, who uh, want, all want to have the, the prestige of receiving a te teachings from this great Mahapandita Atisha. And so here we see the depiction of John Tampa and Kudun uh, meeting with Atisha. And then later on, we'll see there'll be some conflict. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, along the way, then, uh, this going to central Tibet, there's all kinds of issues. And so here, a young uh, bride offers her headdress to Atisha, and then she later has conflict with her family and then jumps into a river and drowns. And Atisha later does not know about this, but then finds out about it. And then he does, uh, next slide, please. He does a lot of uh, rituals. And this is what we see here is that uh, he's staying in these caves in Takar, uh, you know, they were very dependent in their travels uh, upon uh, donations and so forth. And sometimes the village areas that they would get, uh, travel to would, would not offer them any lodging or any, uh, you know, offerings. And so, and so sometimes he was, Atisha and his entourage were accepted and sometimes they were not. And so here we see them in the in caves and he's performing various types of consecration rituals for one, once he found out about this situation with the young bride, which was very troubling for Atisha. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and so as they go along, uh, they make it into uh, central Tibet and then they make it to Lhasa. Uh, and so here we see he visit, or uh, outside of Lhasa, before they get to Lhasa actually, they're in you know, the Samye, the, the, Tibet's first monastery. And so here it shows him uh, seeing the various images of the, the, the of the Zhou Kong, the Zhou, or the, I should say, the great image of the Buddha in Samye Monastery. It also depicts him looking at, in the middle there, lower middle, Sanskrit manuscripts. So there were two manuscripts that supposedly Atisha had never seen while he was in Vikramala Shila. And then one of those was the Majamaka Aloka of Kamala Shila, which was written for the Tibetan king when the great scholar Kamala Shila was in Tibet in the eighth century. And so Atisha had that, co had that copied and sent back 
along with the Avatamsaka. So supposedly the Avatamsaka, or at least the version of the Avatamsaka that existed in Samye, Atisha had not seen before, and he had these copied and sent back to Tibet by messengers. Uh, then uh, he also studied other manuscripts, of a lot of supposedly tantras that were related to the Nyingma tradition, uh, which he said were um, taught by Daikinis. So some of them he would, did acknowledge and others uh, he would not. But here we also see he supposedly is levitating on the walls of Samye. So this was another uh, episode of supersensory power uh, where he's uh, kind of levitating when he's circumambulating the walls of Samye Monastery. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, here we see an aerial modern day view of Samye Monastery. It's one of the world great treasures. It's the Tibet's first great monastery. It's patterned after uh, Mahavarochana Tantra. Uh, and it's got three layers. There's a whole thing about Samye, right? It's a beautiful place. Uh, the next slide, please. So then Atisha, is invited to um, teach in various areas. And so one of the areas, he's um, requested to go teach at this area of Kutun's uh, uh, monastery. And so he goes there, uh, uh, but, and so Atisha at this point, he's got a whole entourage. Uh, he's got some animals with him, right? Like they find puppy, you know, it seems like if they find animals, they would pick them up and take them along the way. You know, it's like, you have to imagine like a kind of traveling entourage, of, you know, ban a band of pe animals and people traveling along. So when Kudan offers, you know, this place for, uh, or offers gold for an offerings to uh, teach at this residence, uh, Atisha agrees, but when they get there, they're there for a little while, and then uh, Kudun doesn't follow uh, his agreement. He doesn't feed and give them proper lo uh, lodging and uh, support. And so actually some of the animals go without food, and actually some of the entourage members also were beginning not to feel well and, and not having food. So then Jantanpa arranges with another Dharma uh, friend of his to bring some Calvary to meet them somewhere because uh, uh, Jontampa did not trust Kudun. So then uh, while Kudun was at this other institution, uh, Atisha and his entourage sneak out of the monastery. And so then they make their way uh, to this river gorge, uh, this river area. And then uh, Kudun finds about out about it and then gets on his horse uh, and Chana and rides full blast to go catch up with Atisha. And so here we have this scene when Kudan uh, catches up with the entourage. And so Jontanpa was the one, uh, they actually crossed the, supposedly here, they crossed the river in uh, two or three trips and Jontanpa went first because he was afraid of getting in a conflict with Kudan, you know, violent conflict. And so Atisha's, you know, going across on the river here, and he's supposedly he's levitating here as well. And so then uh, Kudan rides out in the river in his horse, and he's almost drowning, almost as it were. Uh, and so then uh, Kudan uh, yells at some of Atisha's disciples, "Hey, you must, you know, guests have to act like guests." And then one of them says, "Well, look, we don't want to be your guest." And then. Uh, <laughs> So then Atisha says, look, here, uh, you know, take, take this hat. And so here it shows him, the depiction shows Atisha throwing his pundit's hat across the river to Kudun. And so this kind of shows, this very vividly illustrates the kind of clan-based regional uh, tensions between di different benefactors and disciples. Uh, and then I, that's why I wanted to mention this uh, in the in this slide here. So uh, next slide, please. So then Atisha makes it to finally to Lhasa, right? And uh, here we see, uh, actually in the bottom left is where it begins because when they're outside of Lhasa, supposedly he sees this uh, you know, white man or, uh, that he sees and he gets off his horse and starts doing prostrations. And they ask, what are you doing? And he's like, well, that's my, that's my deity, uh, my special deity, Avalokiteshvara. And so here, that's what this shows in the lower left hand here is Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, greeting Atisha as he enters into Lhasa, right? 
Um, and then uh, he goes on to meet uh, or greet the, the, at the Jonang, uh, the various, uh, the tr or the Trulmang Suklakang, the, the, the various the images of uh, Shakyamuni there, uh, the Joe Oje or, is it, or the Joe as they call it, right? And he also gives some teachings, um, and this is on the right-hand side. He gives teachings on the Majamaka uh, Upadesha, which the short version was included in the Illuminator, and then a longer version was included in Jules, a commentary to actually several early Kadampa commentaries. And then he also revised Bhavi Veka's uh, Tarka Jawala translation in the Lhasa Temple at this time as well. So that's what's depicted uh, here. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, then he goes on to give uh, local teachings in Europa. And um, here we uh, see there's a great throne uh, that was built for Atisha in Europa. And, uh, and so here he's giving those teachings. And supposedly he was offered up to 21 horses. Supposedly the amount of offerings that he received here on this day is the greatest amount of offerings ever given for a Dharma teaching in Tibetan history. But I don't know if that's, if that's true, but he supposedly received a lot of uh, blessings or offerings, which he uh, transformed. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, so then Atisha, his final years, uh, are, they built, they couldn't find a benefactor. You know, there was intentions in Lhasa. And so then he goes, he, they find this place uh, eight kilometers or so from uh, Lhasa, uh, the Natang, very famous temple. They built a temple there for him. And this is where he spends the last years of his life. Uh, and so here we can see uh, some of the uh, figures, uh, uh, even Kudun comes back and he gives teachings to them. And supposedly he, the only teachings at the end of his life he would give would be in the Dharma songs, or uh, like we see the song of the Dharma view in the Illuminator. This is one of the teachings that he gave uh, while he was at Natang. He also, uh, as I've come to find out, which will be in the following volume in the stages of the path, he composed those in secret to Drum Tampa. Uh, this is a uh, chapter uh, 12 or so, the stages of the path after the lamp. He also taught, uh, yeah, it's chapter 12, selections. He taught this at Natong as well, I, I've come to learn. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so then Atisha, um, he um, teaches and studies. He begins to, his health begins to falter but he has visions of Maitreya and Manjushri, right? So this Maitreya, the future Buddha, Bodhisattva, and Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, uh, he has visions of. And he actually commissioned uh, some artists to draw these, and this has been preserved. Uh, I got, uh, only after the book, uh, I saw a picture of this. Uh, this is a thought, you know, thought that radiocarbon dated to 1050. So this is right around the, the end of Atisha's life. And so he then, uh, he has these visions and he's actually calling out his to Manjushri and Maitreya, uh, but his disciples can't see, they don't, they just know his health is starting to go. And then he predicts to them that he will be uh, reborn as the Bodhisattva named uh, Stainless Space in this special pure land area of Tusita heaven, where the future Buddha Maitreya currently resides. So then uh, Atisha uh, passes away uh, and, and then um, they have they build a funeral pyre or a stupa for him in a plain field in Natang. And then here it shows that he's reborn as the Bodhisattva stainless space in this pure land area of Tusita heaven. And so that's, a, I think, a little bit about uh, the life of Atisha. And so... Um, Professor Apple, if I may, I'm gonna, I'm going to read a, a, just a brief paragraph to kind of set the stage for the next kind of the next topics that we'll discuss. Okay. Um, and, and this is an illuminator. I highly suggest you. I put the links in the Facebook feed so all of you can uh, know how to find these books, um, both Illuminator of the Awakening Mind and also Jewels of the Middle Way. But um, I'd like you to. I'll read this to you and then I'll ask a question. In coming to Tibet, Atisha was stripped of the social and ritual institutional duties he had while residing in his Indian monastery of Vikramshila. Ironically, when Atisha arrived in Tibet, because he followed the, as you mentioned, the Mahasamgika Vinaya instead of the Mulasavarsavaran, uh, which was already established in Tibet, he had no other responsibility 
than to teach Mahayana Buddhism in a purified dogmatic manner. Atisha did not have any institutional power and did not establish a Mahasamgika Vinaya ordination lineage while in the land of snows. While in Tibet, Atisha was like a prestigious guest lecturer visiting a modern university, a prestigious guest lecturer, rather than assessing student performance and assigning grades, attending committee meetings or negotiating with administrators and colleagues um, about administrative or pedagogical, pedagogical uh, duties, ostensibly teaches and instructs on just the subject matter at hand. Likewise, while in Tibet, Atisha instructed on just the Mahayana Buddhist practices of the perfection path and the way of the secret mantra vehicle, rather than founding and administering monastic institutions and ordaining monks and nuns. I'll, I'll make a quick note. Uh, I believe that the temple is still in Kathmandu. I, I think it's quite near Tamil. I think they even call it Vikram Shila Vihar, something like that. Those who've been there may uh, confirm that. And uh, uh, from, from what I know is the book as well, is there were three puppies that were picked up along the way. Yes. And um, there's a wonderful anecdote about that. Um, talking though about the time when Akisha comes to Tibet, before we get into the text that, that you've translated, and again, these are the first times these have been translated and shared in the English language, and maybe in any language, I don't know about that beyond Tibetan, um, but could you describe the Buddhism that the, 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 the environment, the Buddhist environment that Atisha would have arrived in, and also that which closely followed his, his passing as we get into the discussion of the text. If you could, that would be very helpful. Yeah, well, here, this is uh, kind of difficult uh, in, that, in that we don't know much about the continuity of when, after the collapse of the Tibetan Empire. So the Tibet, Tibetans had an empire from the seventh to ninth centuries, which traditionally ended around 842 with the assassination of the Tibetan king Long Dharma. And we know there was some continuity, but we don't know the extent of that continuity. And as I mentioned, there's a, a, well, a, a, a Japanese scholar who's done research on the education continuity in after uh, the collapse in Eastern Tibet in Kham and Denma, which seems to be represent the continuity of the Vinaya monastic or the Mula Sarvastivada uh, monastic ordination as well as some of the early um, educational materials that were translated in Abhidharma and also Majamaka. So Atisha, when he arrives in Tibet, uh, you, have the, the, you have this broken empire and they're, they're, it's kind of splintered in east, west, and central, and they're trying to reconstitute things, uh, particularly in West Tibet. So Rinchen Zongpo had already uh, been to Kashmir. They had already sent a number of scholars to Kashmir, of which only a few survived. And then they started building a lot of temples and things. And in fact, there's a lot of artwork that's been preserved from Indic culture that's in West Tibet. And so this was, uh, they were ripe for a figure like Atisha to arrive. That is, they had already rejuvenated uh, temples and there was uh, some uh, beginning of things, but you also have uh, the king, as I mentioned in Illuminator, I believe there's ordinances about problems with regards to uh, misinterpretation of tantric esoteric Buddhism, at least in West Tibet there was. That is, you have problems in uh, the use of um, violence and some you know, other sexuality and so forth that uh, was deemed to be problematic for maintaining order by the king. And so they were looking for a disciplinarian, uh, particularly in Mahayana Buddhist doctrine and discipline to bring together both Vinaya as well as uh, the, the esoteric practices. How could they function together? Because the king had heard, particularly perhaps from Rinchen Zongpo, that in India, there was not a conflict between the monastic ordin uh, ordination and the tantric esoteric Buddhist practices. And the Tibetans at that time did not, you know, see how that, that they were like hot and cold, I think, as I mentioned, the king says, right? They're like hot, they're like, they're not complementary. So that's, you know, in West Tibet. Then in Eastern Tibet, uh, it seems there, there was a continuity. That is, they were using texts and uh, training that they had received uh, during the Tibetan Empire, texts that had been translated in Tibetan 
during the Tibetan Empire were used in Eastern Tibet. So when Atisha comes, and this is to West Tibet, he's got a different understanding of Majamaka, uh, which I illustrate very thoroughly, I hope, I think, in, in the jewels, is that, you know, Atisha's following this figure Chandakirti. None of the works of Chandakirti had been translated yet, or at least only one of them had. Uh, the Yukta Shastika Vritti, uh, the commentary on the 60 Senses of Reasoning had been translated, but they really didn't understand uh, who the, the relevance of Chandakirti. Uh, but also, Atisha, also, as I've mentioned, he practices Majamaka of Nagarjuna, which had been decreed by the Tibetans kings at the Samye debate in the, during the Tibetan Empire period that you know, Tibetans are going to follow Nagarjuna. Well, Atisha's understanding of Nagarjuna was not the exact same as the Tibetans in that Atisha had this view of Nagarjuna that, well, he's, he lived for 600 years. Atisha, that's not a Tibetan understanding. That's Atisha's understanding, right? That Atisha was this miraculous figure. You know, this figure Nagarjuna for Atisha was kind of like, um, you know, I compare him to like Benjamin Franklin when I was growing up. You know, this, this prolific uh, author who invented electricity or did all these, you know, he was a politician and he did all these things. So, you know, there's this episode, I don't remember if I included in the book where Atisha, he's like staying at some hut or something and they light a fire with like an ignition switch. And then Atisha's like, where does where that, where's that come from? Nagarjuna didn't invent that. You know, like uh, Atisha thought that not only was, you know, Nagarjuna this great Siddha, but that he also invented like, you know, certain technology and things that he was an alchemist, of course. And so Atisha, he, uh, Nagarjuna was this kind of all-embracing figure of a uh, Siddha, alchemist, yogi, Majamaka philosopher. And so uh, when Atisha comes to Tibet, he has uh, a lot of Atisha's uh, understanding of Majamaka thought, middle way thought of Nagarjuna is based on the, the poetic hymns, the stavas uh, of Nagarjuna, which talk about this, you know, non- uh, conceptual, non-mental Buddha that, you know, miraculously does things. And so the Tibetans at that time, they had, they were, you know, based on what they call the six texts of reasoning. Their understanding of Nagarjuna was based on, you know, reasoning consciousness uh, only, or uh, and not, and also, <laughs> more importantly than this, Atisha also had this, you know, Mahasangika ordination lineage, but he, but he, that he was not allowed to consecrate or uh, establish monks or nuns, or uh, and he was also not allowed to establish a monastery. And you know, all if you read about ordination lineage, you know, the the Tibetans preserve the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya. Uh, it's a, every Tibetan monk you'll ever meet is ordained within the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya. And the Mula Savasta Vinaya is a great testament to Buddhist world literature. There's over 8,400 pages preserved. And we have some of this in Sanskrit. And uh, the, you know, the foremost scholar of this is Gregory Chopin at UCLA. And you know, a couple of years ago, I offered a, a seminar on this Mula Savasta Vinaya. And it's very amazing. You know, everything from telling time to, uh, you, know, how you, you know, how they kept time, uh, uh, regulation of life uh, as fully documented in these uh, vinya and but the the issue is is that you know when i was at wisconsin you know geisha sopala was a monk and so i would always come to, to ask him you know, come to him with questions about the vinya and he would say he would tell me well you're a lay person you're not allowed to study, study the vinya so <laughs> all these years in grad you know the years in graduate school you know i just learned about philosophy or uh, you know path, the path soteriology and so forth but I, I, uh, I never really approached the Vinaya because I thought it was off limits to non-monastic people. So then uh, here years later, I've you know, learned about a lot about it. And this issue comes up in the life of Atisha. And so it, it, it turns out that in Atisha's biography, which I, I didn't include this little paragraph, but the reason supposedly Atisha took the Mahasangika Vinaya was because they're the, they were the only Vinaya that tolerated the practice of esoteric Buddhism at the time. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's fully, I, I haven't investigated that, but there were a whole number of other monks, well-known, very famous, uh, that were at uh, Vikram Lashila that practiced or held the Mahasangika ordination lineage. And so 
the Maha Sangika ordination lineage, we only have fragments of. We don't, uh, it's preserved in Chinese, but we don't have an Indic Sanskrit full. Uh, we have the Bhikshini, uh, the nuns uh, partially, but not of the Bhikshu, the Bhikshu Vinaya part. And so uh, this is important because not only was the teacher not allowed to uh, teach the Maha Sangika Vinaya, but, and he was also not allowed to teach the Dohas, these rhyming couplets or these couplet poetic teachings of the Maha, uh, advanced tantric, uh, the Siddhas like Saraha and Talopa and Naropa, this sudden realization, right? The sudden realization through Doha couplets. He, uh, uh, John Tumpa was very conservative about this. They, so to, it turns out that the establishment in Tibet at the time was very conservative with regards to certain aspects of Atisha's teaching. And, you know, they brought him there, I think mainly for his renown as a disciplinarian. And this is what the later Galupa tradition wants to show. They don't really focus on his Majamaka or on his uh, tunt, you know, the way Atisha understood esoteric practices. The Galupa tradition preserves his, and the Sankapa particularly represents his ethical discipline right this ethical moral conduct and that's one thing that they, they they share very much but then how they go about preserving that is quite different and how they and how they go about you know majamaka philosophy is is much different uh also uh i was wanting to say something else about the mahasangika vinaya that well this is how we know i, I put the stages of the path selections in the illuminator and one of the sections there atisha explicitly mentions i want to mention i will i want to say a few good words about the mahasangika's ordination lineage so there's not a so this is how we know that atisha must have written this book or these teachings because there's not a known monk that uh, a tibetan monk that ever took a mahasangika ordination uh, uh he ne no Tibetan monks ever took a Mahasangika ordination ceremony. So for That's someone mean. to speak of the greatness of the Mahasangika Vinaya must have been somebody like Atisha. That's brilliant. Well, I, I'm going to, I know we've got texts we're going to get, and this, this is a perfect jumping off point to talk about these differences. I know Professor Apple will talk about these differences between Tsongkhapa and Atisha's understanding of Middle Way, um, as well as a few of the other texts that he's newly translated. I'll just make a quick comment here. Those watching on Facebook, please uh, put questions in the comments section. You can send them privately to the Facebook um, inbox for Tse Ling Center for Tibetan Buddhist Studies. We'll ask those at the end. I know it's a very broad topic and, and uh, um, I will say that I'm very glad to see in our, our Zoom meeting uh, some familiar faces from India. Um, and uh, I will say that there's at least one person watching from Bangladesh, the birthplace, the current birthplace of, of uh, Atisha. So that's really a wonderful thing. Uh, Professor Apple, let's get into these texts that, that you've selected to focus on uh, today. Okay. Uh, we want to start off with uh, which one? Chapter 10, Middle Way Special Instructions for Cultivating All the Qualities in the Scriptures. Is that right? No. Uh, be before that, could we talk about, um, there's that very brief prayer, the praise to Tara in the sure. form of the three jewels. Um, can we talk about, before we get into the really heady stuff, let's talk about the, uh, the devotional aspect. <laughs> yes. Well, so uh, we have here in chapter 13, I gave, I, I translated a number of selections for Tara. And so Tara uh, is well known as the uh, savioress, right? She's, has a, uh, you know, begins in the sixth century, roughly in India. And then, so she's a very important deity. Uh, you know, her history is documented and so forth, particularly uh, The Cult of Tar by Stephen Byer is a good book, and also The Songs of the Saviors by Martin Wilson. But the worship of, of, Tibet, of Tara in, uh, in Tibet begins in earnest with Atisha because he brings with him the, uh, most of the ritual um, basis for which later Tibetan traditions practice Atisha. And so Atisha receives prophecies and guidance from Tara throughout his life. And here we see, uh, I translated, 
Now, how in the works of Atisha, there's around 120 uh, works of Atisha, but only four of the only four to seven or so in the in the official uh, Tengur ten and Kengur uh, preserve Tara. And so here we see the tree rot. Uh, the um, what we see here is the tree rotna stro uh, tree rotna star Tara Strotra. Okay, so this is a devotional hymn. And this is actually, uh, I uh, looked around, I was looking, I was like looking around for this earlier, and this is actually preserved in the uh, Tibetan uh, Tengur, Tengur. So this is a canonical uh, work of Atisha's, uh, this uh, Tree Ratna uh, Praise to Tara as the Three Jewels, the uh, Tree Ratna Tara Stota. And, but what I, I accidentally left out of the book is the colophon. So the colophon shows that this was actually composed for uh, Natsu Lotawa at Vikamala Shila Monastery. So uh, when a teacher comes to Tibet, he's, um, he, he's restricted. He is not allowed to teach all the uh, esoteric aspects of Tara. That would, become, that would come later. So he actually teaches two main forms, green Tara and, or, and white Tara. And white Tara, he was able to publicly teach because this was related to a revelation from Vage Ishvara Kirti. And so uh, that becomes more public. And so here we see this, uh, this little snippet that I included. I noticed that it had not been translated before and I thought it would make a nice little translation. And so this shows, uh, this really shows um, something that Atisha actually teaches to Rinchen Zongpo earlier in the book, right? I had mentioned uh, in, in, if you read in the Illuminator on page 40 to 41, there's an episode where Rinchen Zongpo, you know, is practicing all these different deities. He's, met, he's, you know, he's, he's taking all the consecrations and he's, you know, uh, meditating on one floor on one deity and then, you know, another on another floor and he's meditating it throughout the night. And then Atisha realizes this is why I should have, I needed to come to Tibet. So he instructs Rinchen Zongpo, look, you can meditate on just one de deity at a time in one place. And that is enough. And so here we see this kind of uh, attitude in that Tara as a deity becomes this all encompassing, not just uh, uh, one goddess with uh, you know, particular attributes, but becomes the whole encompasses the whole uh, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. That is the three jewels itself. And so here uh, the opening begins, homage to you, Tara, the Buddha. So here Tara, right? She's not just a Bodhisattva for, for Atisha. She's a fully awakened female Buddha. And so he plays uh, homage to her as a Buddha. And then also uh, as someone who immediately eliminates uh, wrong views, uh, ignorance. She's also got Sarva Akarajnana or Tamche Kimpa. She is omniscient and she has attained complete perfect Buddhahood. And so this is a very important aspect of Tara for Atisha is that she embodies full Buddhahood as a in the feminine form. But then also here, uh, Tara is, and fully embodies the noble Dharma, the Dharma, and, and here her mantra, which is the, uh, very famously the Om Tara Tutari Turi Soha, the 10 letters. These 10 letters in the second verse get correlated to 10 perfections, right? The standard six plus uh, four more. And so her 10 letters here represent uh, the 10 perfections and the great bliss of peaceful nirvana. Then the third verse represents uh, the kind of tantric aspect of it and that her you know, secret body, speech, and mind represents the aggregation of wisdom dakinis, the yeshi kadromas. And so here, though, that refers not only to, you know, that can be also inner, outer, and secret, right? That is, you know, outer, it would be, you know, the uh, feminine forces that he would meet in the tantric context, but also can be the inner energies that are transformed. Right. And so here Tara represents the embodiment of all that as well. And so I included this uh, homage to uh, the three, uh, three uh, jewels, uh, Tara embodying the three jewels as a kind of a, a clear example of how she uh, it was very important to Atisha. Now, 
I also included other selections here, uh, right? Of you know, the, the white taro, which didn't necessarily have to have uh, the consecrations as much as uh, the green taro, shama taro. Uh, then you have also the protection from the eight fears, which is both external and internal uh, type things. The abridged clear realization of noble Tara, I think is translated for the first time uh, that I included. Now also uh, there were several other uh, texts of Atara that are included in um, the Kadampa manuscripts that I did not include in the, in the, in the book, right? So you know here, <laughs> Press for time, got to make quick choices. And I tried, I wanted to make uh, things um, readable and not too uh, complicated, right? But we, uh, there's another text that I was looking over today and I, um, of Atisha's where, uh, and I don't know where I placed it now. I just printed it out before we, uh, in any case, what's important to note is, is that here, Atisha, right? You have in Natong, uh, so Atisha gives these two main teachings on Tara, that is the green Tara and the white Tara, and the white Tara is related to the cycle of ten Tibetan lineages of cheating death. That is, you know, white Tara, if you, uh, if you receive these teachings, are related to healing and long life. But then also Atisha, he has uh, a, a, a Tara t chapel at Natong, right? And the Tara Chapel at Natong uh, has 21 Taras. So it was thought that the Tisha brought the 21 Taras to Tibet, but he didn't uh, openly propagate those teachings. And so the, the, the 21 Taras at the, ta the Natong Tara Chapel, they all are painted gold, or they're also identical. But what I found in this uh, manuscript this, uh, today is that uh, that's preserved from the Kadampa manuscripts is actually he brought, he did bring the 21 Taras and they're connected to the prophecies in his own life. So the cycle of teachings is called the, uh, the cycle of predictions from noble Tara. And it gives each one of the 21 forms with them with her mantra and a particular color that one should visualize. And also, um, what type of activity that that Tara does. So that's a secret teach. And then the lineage for it is very close. It was kept by Drumtunpa and some early Kadampas. So that's another example of these early Kadampa teachings that were not widespread and that are preserved in the Kadampa manuscripts. Fascinating. And, and, and we're gonna continue with that theme because I know the other selections that Professor Apple has selected also kind of show a uniqueness um, so let's let's move on to those. Um, Professor Apple, do you want to begin with the you tell me where to go here? And if I may just say we have a few questions already. Um, okay. They're head questions. And I if sure. it's OK with Professor Apple, we may go about 50 minutes beyond our scheduled end time. And if everybody's cushions are comfortable and everybody feels good, we'll just stay right here and maximize our our, our time with Professor Apple. OK. Yeah, so let's go to chapter 10, the middle way special instructions, right? I think we have some quotes for that. And uh, yeah, see here. Here's that special Tara, Tara text I was just talking about. All right, so in any case, uh, chapter 10, right, was the middle way special instruction for cultivating all the qualities in the scriptures, right? And so this is a, a, an important um, example. So this, I chose this text and put it in there because it's in the Kadampa manuscripts and it combined, it's like an oral teaching that some uh, Tibet, an early Kadampa wrote down and that uh, it, and, and it, and it combines uh, two kinds of meditations that Atisha frequently uses. And so this meditation exercise here that will be in a later portion here, uh, he frequently includes, and it's found uh, throughout the open basket of jewels, and it's, it's mentioned several times in both the jewels in the middle way, as well as the illuminator. But here, first on though, he has this early quotation where he talks about you sit down on a seat and then you contemplate, 
And here, I thought that this, this was an important uh, citation because it shows the seriousness of samsara. That is, you know, uh, I wrote down in my, I mean, people might not like this, but Atisha's Buddhism is not John Lennon's Imagine, okay? You know, for, for Atisha, you got, there's heaven and there's hell and there's consequences if you have wrong, wrong actions, okay? And so here we have an example of samsara, like what it means, you know, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of, you know, taking birth, aging, sickness, and death, right? And so here, this meditation, we have a real clear meditation on samsara. It says, throughout my existence in samsara, from the beginning of this time till the day, I've been from the highest heaven down to the lowest hell. There's no place I haven't taken rebirth. There's no person I have not met. There's no food, not, you know, there's no type of food I have not eaten. And there's no suffering I have not experienced. Now, if I don't want to return this type of cyclic existence, I'll have to eternally wonder. And so, you know, this reminds me, I can remember when I lived at Deer Park, you know, the monks there, they told me about when the term cyclic existence was coined, you know, by, I guess, Robert Thurman or somebody in around 1962 for samsara. You know, usually samsara is a samsarana, right? Which means wondering. Uh, wondering about and so forth. Uh, sometimes the students, you know, are like wondering what the hell I'm talking about. But here it's wondering, you know, uh, lifetime after lifetime. So here, cyclic existence, rebirth. That is every conceivable thing that are, one's already experienced through innumerable lifetimes. Usually Atisha expresses this through meditation on mother-like sentient beings, right? That we've uh, all been here so many times. Uh, over that every one of us has been one person's mother in a previous lifetime. Okay, that's how that's how long samsara is. It's you know eternal. So this is the first little meditation about this samsara is renunciation uh, to get out. Uh, the next slide, please. So here, Atisha lays down that you know this cause of samsara, the seed of existence is this you know, uh, consciousness. And he takes that quite literally, right? Because for him, Buddhahood is not going to have any type of consciousness. Buddhahood is going to be like the sun or the ocean. It's just going to be pure illumination. And so here, the cause of samsara is apprehending things is real. And so ev everyone from non-Buddhists, even to certain types of majamakas who use utilize reasoning, are caught up in some type of thought. And so for Atisha, uh, there's no means of finding peace except through the system of, of Nagarjuna. And he actually says this in another work, the entry into the two realities, right? That is, there's no way, there's only one, the only way of finding the uh, release from uh, peace from samsara is through the lineage of Nagarjuna and his student Chandrakirti. Uh, next slide, please. So here then Atisha uses Agama. And here he cites a very uh, famous example from the Kashapa Parivarta, the chapter on Kashapa, right? And so here the Buddha instructs Kashapa, you know, the, the mind has not been seen, uh, will not be seen, and has not been seen because it, it, you, it's not findable under analysis. And so when one searches through uh, analyzing and looking at mind or any object of mind and then the mind itself, uh, it's dissolved and cannot be found. And then also the subjective consciousness that's uh, searching for it also cannot be found. And so here Atisha states, like what we uh, also hear in the Kashyapa Parivarta, when the analytical mind searches out an object, it's like rubbing two sticks together. So the sticks together, here the analytical consciousness and its object rub together. And then that fire, the fire of wisdom is, that's uh, created, uh, incinerates both the object and the consciousness, and one becomes at, at peace through having no more conceptual uh, vikalpa or conceptual thought. And so the very, the, here the idea is that insight incinerates things upon analysis and then the very in, uh, analysis itself is incinerated. Uh, the next slide, please. Is there, so here then, just as when the fuel of conceptual thought is exhausted, the fire no longer arises the object analyzed and the mind that analyzes uh, remains in the condition of peace. And then suchness or the way of things, which for Atisha is going to be this luminous emptiness that's empty of intrinsic essence, 
uh, itself emerges. And so there, uh, when the object to be, and so then here he quotes, I believe, Shantideva and the Bodhichari avatar, the entry into the awakening, uh, court conduct of awakening. When the object to be investigated is being investigated, there exists no object support for investigating mind because there does not exist in an object of support. The consciousness uh, does not as rise. And that is called, uh, what is that called? That is called, and that is called Nirvana, peace. And so here, Atisha is emphasizing this Majamaka that is the uh, uh, elimination of conceptual proliferations. And so that is very much his middle way. And so then he gives advice about what to do after these uh, quotations. But that little uh, mental exercise, those two exercises, that is this exercise, in this instance, the exercise was of renunciation and analytical insight. Usually it will be compassion and analytical insight. But those two little snippets are what are put together in the mental uh, spiritual exercises of Atisha. And he frequently mentions this uh, and so that's why I brought this up is that uh, awakening for Atisha is beyond any mental or mental uh, elements. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and I know, um, you know, I know we're, we're leading up to kind of, and again, I'm just going to point out here, I find it fascinating that essentially, if you read these books, you find out that the texts that, that Professor Apple has translated were essentially divorced from the commentarial tradition in Tibet after it, Professor Apple is that the 17th century. So post 17th century, the, the scholars, there's no commentary on it. So, so what's what's interesting then is is it no surprise then that we see this difference in the way that Tsongkhapa and Atisha express the middle way philosophy as as we get closer to that is it are, is it not surprising then because of that fact? Well, it, what it's real surprising is this Tsongkhapa, right? That so, uh, it starts with Tsongkhapa that you know Tsongkhapa goes his own way. He kind of you know beat. Uh, forges the text into his vision of Majamaka, which is quite different than a number of the other traditions. And it turns out that it's quite different than Atisha's. And so uh, this then carries on, right? Uh, you know, Atisha is selectively cited as an authoritative figure, but uh, he's, he's never really gone into or commented upon by the Galupas or even later, as you mentioned, other traditions. And this is because uh, I don't think his text circulated after the 17th century. So as I mentioned in Jules, right, you have Tukan Churginima, Tukan Churginima and Chankiropa Dorje. They don't have any idea of these texts. And I'm not sure, so sure how much uh, Sankapa knew of these texts either, because, you know, uh, Rating, you know, Sankapa did re uh, retreats at Rating, but Rating Monastery was slightly destroyed by uh, the Mongols. And so, so uh, currently, uh, and then also kind of just to let ahead on the circle of the research of my third, this book on the stages is that the Mongols supported, you know, the Sakya, or they wound up supporting the Sakyas, but they recited, they supported a lot of Kagyu groups too. And so the Kadampas were seeking support from the Tongu or Minak in Tibetan, Jijia kingdom. And so when the Mongols conquered the Jijia kingdom, that's when the Kadampas actually lost patronage. And so what was being uh, advertised was the, the Mahamudra type teachings that we'll see here uh, that the, the Gampopa brought up. But that's why perhaps uh, Jay Rinpoche Sankaba, he might not have had access to some of the chapters and jewels. I mean, I was real, you know, when I, I can remember being in Kyoto, Japan, preparing a lecture and I uh, had photocopies of these manuscripts and I realized uh, that I had not seen anything like this before. And, uh, you know, I'd been trained at least in the majority of uh, Sankapa's works, the Rick Big Yatso, Lake Ching Ningpo, Lan Rim Chimmo, <coughs> Bumpa Rapsel from Geshe Sopala over many summers. So I, you know, I remember, and then I can also remember 
you know, uh, even back then, even before the Kanapa manuscripts, I can remember one summer we were doing the Lamrim Chimo for you know, many weeks. And, you know, Sankapa would quote Atisha very, and then I thought, well, wait, we just read this open basket of jewels. Why doesn't he ever mention that so much? And, you know, Sankapa really uh, selectively cited Atisha and utilized him as an exemplar in moral authority, not necessarily from a Jamaka view. So let's use that as a jumping off point to get to that, the differentiation between those two views. We, okay, we sure. So but I created a slide here and um, this is actually, uh, I don't know if I want to give all the way my sources. I realize this, this, this will make a nice little article here if I uh, uh, put it together, right? But here we have uh, just a quick differentiation Right, and this was actually, you know, this has been uh, noted by Japanese scholars for quite some time. And some of these articles are in Japanese, but and some are in English. But you know, just a quick analysis of Atisha and Sankaba's thought. And uh, here, the first top, I mean, just we have the categories in the middle. You know, thesis, convention, you know, uh, conventional valid cognition, the existence of external objects. Uh, the Taurang, Swatanchika, Prasanga, and then also Buddhahood. And so here we can see Atisha. You know, Atisha and this work in Jules called The General Explanation of the Two Realities very clearly says that Majamakas do not have any positive thesis whatsoever. They just refute opponents' assertions. Well, Sankapa goes to great lengths in the Lamrim Chemo to establish that Majamakas have a thesis. And in fact, a very great scholar, David Seifert Ruig in England, uh, devoted a great uh, amount of his career to, to arguing just that point, that Majamakas have a thesis, right? And so here it's quite surprising that Atisha denies that. Next, you have this uh, Tane Sema, right? This convention, you know, con Sambia, Sam, Sambahara Pramanaka, you know, conventional valid cognition. Well, you know, Sankapa does something quite amazing that the Galupas are well known for, which is this Dharmakirti and Chandakirti back to back, right? The lions back to back. They cannot be defeated because of valid, conventional valid cognition. Which, and so scholars are just really trying to figure this out. How did Sankapa combine Dharmakirti with Chandakirti? But, you know, here, Atisha, Dharmakirti and Dignaga are just part of Hetu Vidya, the science of justificatory reasoning, which is used as a profane secular science to refute opponents of Buddhist Dharma, right? So here you have a difference that in Tibet, you mainly had, as Shanti Rakshita predicted, Buddhists would be arguing with Buddhists. But in, in India, as we saw in his life story, you had Buddhists arguing with non-Buddhists. And so the Buddhists had to be really prepared to defeat and argue with uh, in the arena of debate, of which could be very costly if you lost, uh, this, this secular science to refute opponents. And so for Atisha, debate is just a way of, as a conventional activity that doesn't have any point in realization of the Buddha's, you know, the Buddha's emptiness, the highest realization and ultimate reality is beyond reasoning for Atisha, right? It's you're using conceptual thought to dissolve conceptual thought. And so there's not going to be a, a parma arta pramanika. There's not going to be a valid cognition of ultimate reality because it, it's not, that, that's not possible for a teacher. Also here, very surprisingly, is external objects. You know, Sankapa will say here, uh, he, Sankapa wrote this little work that was dictated down by his senior disciple, Galsap, about the eight special qualities of Majamaka. And one of these is going to be the positing of external objects. So Sankapa will say external objects conventionally exist, but they ultimately don't exist. Okay, so that's what Sankapa will say. And this was in a, outlined once again in this book by David Ruig, uh, published around 2002. But here, surprisingly, in the jewels in the middle way, Atisha says something very subtle. And he actually is debated by, uh, by Tibetans about this. And that is, he's, uh, uh, this is what we call uh, pratibas, uh, Pratibasa Matra Majamaka. Nangwatsa Umapa. That is mere appearance Majamaka. That is ob uh, conventional objects are mutually dependent mere appearances that are shaped by the subject as well as the object. 
That's why for Atisha, he will use this analogy, uh, and I haven't published this yet, but it's a very famous analogy of why a god will see the, you know, a god, you know, when the god sees this, they see nectar. When a hungry ghost sees this, they see pus and blood. When a human like me sees it, we see water. Well, why is that? Well, you know, the Galupas have, you know, have a very, various different arguments. But for Atisha, it's mutual dependent mere appearance, shaped by the subjective karma of the individual, as well as the dependent arising of the so-called object. So they're not, for Atisha, he doesn't exert external objects. Likewise here, uh, as I document, right, uh, this Talrong uh, or you know, Rangyupa and ta, uh, Prasangika Svatantrika distinction, which becomes very famous in Tibet, particularly with Sankapa, doesn't exist for Atisha. That, that distinction of Majama, you know, Atisha was a, uh, in India, he had lineages of Majamaka from various teachers. And he brought, he followed what I call, you know, a kind of pure Majamaka, that is, he was able to accommodate differences, let's say between Bhavi Viveka and Chandrakirti. And so here, Atisha follows this type of Majamaka, which I outlined in the Jewels in the Middle Way, in which Chandrakirti and Bhavi Viveka are compatible. And the main problem, the main enemy is Yogacharas, Samsampa, Chinamatrans. These are the people that uh, Atisha sees as faulty in their views. Okay, and this comes out in the early Kadampa commentary on the entry to the two realities. That's something brand new. We have, in other words, you know, Atisha gives these 28 verses on the entry to the two realities, the Satchadwai Avatara, and it's not quite clear who the opponents are. Well, the commentary clearly outlines this, that it's not some other uh, lower level Majamakan, it's the yoga ch Yogacharas. Now, for a course, for Sankapa in his Lamrim Chimmo, uh, and you can you can read it in English on page two pages two twenty five to two seventy five in the third volume of the English, or if you like Tibetan, the nineteen eighty five version from pages six seventy three to seven nineteen. Sankapa lays out the differences between Swatantrika of Bhaviveka and the Prasangika of Chandrakirti, and he actually will he'll actually claim that Bhaviveka is not even a real Majamakan, but which I don't even think a teacher could conceive of, right? But that's a big distinction. Now, and then here we get finally to the a big distinction, which uh, even Tibet, even Atisha's own disciples cannot fully uh, like these Tibetan disciples. But Atisha's view was actually a very standard Indian view, and that is Buddhahood is this inconceivable attainment which has no mental factors whatsoever. And, you know, here, one of my previous advisors, he wrote a very famous article called, you know, Thoughtless Buddha, Passionate Buddha. And, you know, he compares, in Chandrakirti, compares the Buddha to like a robot. But, you know, Atisha and his commentators, they compare the Buddha to like the sun or the ocean. And, I, and I, you know, so I kind of like that metaphor of the sun. You know, the Buddha is not some automaton robot for me. He's like the sun. It's like this natural force of the universe that's overpowering, that gives light, illuminates things. But yet has no mental, no mental qualities, no mental elements, right? The sun just selflessly gives life to everything. And that's how the Buddhas operate as well. They don't, they don't have conceptual thought for Atisha, right? But Sankapa and the, his disciples are very troubled by this. So they will they will read these same Indic passages that Atisha reads as not saying that there's no mental awareness at all. They will say there's no there's it's a non-dual awareness that it's what's being eliminated is conceptual awareness and that what uh, does exist is the non-dual awareness and so that that's a big point uh, even uh, Drontanpa had doubts about this and certainly Potawa and other early Kadampa figures you know the Tibet the, the old Tibetan uh, this nature of the mental element in Buddhahood uh, is very old Tibetan issue. Right. And so Atisha, uh, the earlier question was, well, what did Atisha come to Tibet and bring with him? Well, he brought with him this different understanding of Buddhahood, which uh, was very classically Indian in, in a way, but which was not fully accepted by uh, other Tibetan and Tibetan followers. 
So that's a little bit about that chart. <laughs> that's 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 a it's a lot a lot of it of that chart, which is wonderful. And I mean, uh, it's it's just fascinating. Um, you know, so we again, I know we're 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 going to go fifteen minutes over for everybody. Um, we've got a few questions, and we've got one more short selection to touch upon. Oh, you know, okay. so much of us know Atisha as the the as you as your book says, the illuminator of the awakening mind, as the um, the the father of this lineage of Kadampas with these pithy sayings that show us in this very uh, rough way on how to train our mind. Um, understanding Atisha is, is essentially as a middle way practitioner is, is a new thing, but even more so this notion of Atisha as a secret mantra practitioner is something that's really, um, at least for me, a very new identity to be able to, to that's being revealed. And your work reveals that. We, we have a selection here. Could you speak very briefly as we lead into this selection about that? You mentioned earlier on that, that he was taking teachings from these as a lay person, even before he ordained, he was being exposed to those, that lineage that, that with, with Siddhas in the forests in, in what is now Bangladesh. Um, lead us into that as we talk about the secret mantra practitioner, Atisha. Yeah, well, okay, so Atisha is fully trained before he becomes a monk, as we mentioned. He was in the uh, practices of Havajra as a yog, tantric yogi for like eight years or eight or nine years of his life. And then he received full domestic training in the various tantric, esoteric tantric traditions at Vikramala Shila Monastery. And uh, he was also, as a Bengali, fully versed in the Doha literature and of Saraha and Talopa and Naropa. And in fact, Atisha had this Maha Mudra lineage or great seal lineage, this highest level teaching lineage from Talopa, Naropa and Dombipa, and other Maha Siddhas. And so as his biography mentions, right, on Vikram uh, Lashila, they had two walls of murals. One was with scholars and one, Panditas and one other was Siddhas. And Atisha was the only one on both walls. So he was a scholar and a siddha uh, with his own lifetime, uh, recognized within his own lifetime. And so he was not, once again, fully allowed to uh, teach these teachings while in Tibet by his disciple, Duntunpa. But here, uh, uh, the chapter 14 in the Jewels, right, or the Illuminator, I included. Uh, an, an example of this advanced teaching, which is usually attributed to Gampopa, but it turns out that it's Atisha that started it. And this is the what's called the Lanchik Kejor, or Sahaja Yoga, that is co-emergent union. And I think, uh, did we have a slide for the first paragraph of this? Uh, I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about it. And uh, you know, this koa, this, this, this is uh, thought to be a lost manuscript, right? So this is actually a highly advanced tantric teaching. And I don't know if I'll go all the way, you know, much, you know, totally into it. But here, Atisha is, this is what's called Sahaja Yoga. And he actually has a couple other works that I didn't publish where he, he talks about this. And he talks about it more in a tantric context. And that is you have to receive a consecration and so forth, right, to begin these advanced practices. And then this is related to uh, the advanced, uh, advanced understanding of the luminosity of the mind. Okay. And that is, and so here we see in the Majamaka, the middle way teachings, a kind of use of reasoning to dissolve conceptual thought. But there's also another technique, another form of skillful means in which the guru points out to the ready disciple, the nature of the mind. And this pointing out instruction uh, is very quick to awaken. And this is actually uh, was utilized by the Siddhas like Saraha and Talopa and Naropa. This, uh, it's not well, full. we don't have a chartered history of pointing out instructions in uh, Western literature yet, right? There's a book that needs, is yet to be written, but here, particularly among the Kagyu, right? If you read a, a text like 
the Moonbeams of Mahamudra by Takpo Tashi Namgyal, uh, you'll see the full uh, development of that tradition. Well, that tradition among the Kagyu is thought to be by Gampopa, the Dwakpo Laje, the doctor of, uh, uh, of Dwakpo, who uh, was a very famous Kadampa monk, or he was a Kadampa monk before he studied under Milarepa. And then that has the beginnings of the Kagyu tradition. Well, they say, you know, Gampopa is very famous for this co-emergent union, Lenchik Kejor, but it's actually Atisha who brought it with him to Tibet, and, but it was very closed. And so here at, in chapter 14 of the Illuminator, I included an example of this. And so here, this is a kind of written down oral teaching that Atisha gave to his disciple here. It says, this is a pre extremely profound instruction that Atisha bestowed upon Gumpawa. So that's a very important fact factor here. That is Gumpawa Wongchuk Gyaltsen was of the younger generation that of Atisha's dis, early Kadampa disciples. He wasn't uh, like Drontanpa. So he wasn't fully trained and he wasn't set in his ways as it were. So he was open to new teachings and he was also an advanced meditator. So Atisha then gave him this instruction, right? And this instruction is uh, what's called on the, uh, what's called here, you sometimes conate mind or the innate mind or the uh, co-emergent mind, the, uh, this sahaja. And here sahaja can also, ref uh, among early siddhas, it refers to the kind of spontaneous anti-rhetorical nature of the practices that some of the Mahasiddhas in India would get, you know, they had enough of the tantric ritual, the rituals and so forth, and they were much into spontaneity and so forth. But Atisha offers a program of actually teaching this uh, on a, in a gradual manner. And this is, was known, this is known among, uh, in Tibetan histories, if you look, uh, that I've researched for the forthcoming book, among the Kagyu, that is, <coughs> this, Elanchik Kajor, uh, co-emergent union that Atisha teaches, he actually, uh, just to let the cat out of the bag, that's how he uh, ends the stages of the path. The stages of the path that I let out, did not include in the Illuminator are the instructions of shamatha, or serenity and insight given according to the co-emergent union way. Now, later Kagyupas will call this essence Mahamudra or Sutra Mahamudra. But Atisha doesn't give it that name. Atisha just refers to it as Sahaja. And he actually says this in the, if you read closely his commentary to the lamp on the path, the Bodhimarga Padipa Panjika commentary, there's a, he has a little short sentence where he says, there's two types of wisdom. There's wisdom that's Lenchik Kepa, Sahaja, and then there's gradual. And then he says, I will now go on to speak about gradual. So the gradual uh, wisdom, right, the, the, which is the tersam uh, gongsum, the wisdom which arises from hearing, reflection, and meditation using reasoning is what he uh, articulates in the Bodhimarga Padipa Panjika. But here he's giving a pointing out instruction, right? And so this is the uh, pointing out instruction which shows that the co-emergent mind, this uh, kind of natural state of luminous emptiness, is actually co-emergent with the dharmakaya or the dharma body. And that is this uh, co-emergent appearance. And so here they are like the moon and the light of the moon. And that as one trains in these and, and becomes more and more uh, skillful, they will understand the essence, nature, and character of this mind such that when they are fully trained in this uh, clear light recognition of the mind, when the time of the natural clear light occurs at the time of death, they will be able to recognize that and merge with it. And so that type of advanced co-emergent union is what's being instructed here in the chapter 14. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Professor Apple. We're gonna to get to our questions here in the last part of this, and then we'll have some concluding remarks. Uh, we'd like to give you that opportunity uh, and then Sechen Ling will say something as well. Um, we have a couple questions from within the Zoom meeting, if, if you would all like to ask those questions yourself, uh, we'll go to uh, Venerable Tenzin Lexo. Um, I'm going to unmute you and uh, I'll have you ask, uh, ask your questions. We have two questions from uh, Tenzin Lexo. 
Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, for your talk. It was really enjoyable, very informative, um, and for your research in general. Um, my first question was, oh, you mentioned that Atisha took a lot of, um, seems like, highest yoga tantra initiations before he um, went to Sumatra to study bodhicitta. So I was wondering, you know, nowadays, if we take a highest yoga tantra initiation, we have to take bodhisattva vows first, which assumes you have quite a good understanding of bodhicitta already. But it seems like Atisha didn't have that, you know, that he seemed to be doing highest yoga tantra without a good understanding of bodhicitta. So I was wondering if that modern case where you, it's assumed you have the basis of bodhicitta as a prerequisite for tantra was not there in the past, maybe, or what? No, no, it was definitely there. Actually, he did, um, Atisha studied um, initial uh, bodhicitta awakening mind with Jitari, Bodhi, uh, Bodhibhadra, and uh, Vidya Kokila. So he did receive, and then also from Avadutipa too, he did receive teachings on bodhicitta. But what he goes and receives from Serlingpa in Sumatra is that these advanced teachings on the exchange of oneself and others, and then also the uh, teachings in the Abhisamaya Alamkara, right? The non Portopagan, the ornament for clear realization. So uh, also the teachings that become uh, precedents for Lojong. So for, and those were, Lojong teachings were actually kept secret. You know, the Dalai Lama teaches on mind training. Uh, Tupin Jimpa has a great book on mind training. Those are open, more open teachings now, but among early Kadampas, they're actually very secretive. So it's, uh, and also, um, I should say here, you know, the Bodh Bodhicitta, as you kind of just mentioned in your question, right, there's all kinds of levels of Bodhicitta. And certainly there's different interpretations and, le and levels within esoteric Buddhist practice, as well as in uh, Mahayana Buddhist practice. So Atisha did receive a basic uh, foundation in the awakening mind, Bodhicitta, when he, in his youth. But it, when he goes to um, Sumatra, from what I can tell, he learns Abhisamaya Lamkara. In, in fact, he brings back with him the, the, uh, the uh, Abhisamaya Lamkara uh, commentary by Dharmakirti Sri, Serlingpa. This is one of the oldest extant literature in, of Southeast Asian authorship. That, and this is actually kind of what's interesting is that the lineages of Mahayana Buddhism that were pro propagated in Southeast Asia only survive in Tibet. And so that's this exchange of oneself and others, which was actually a very secretive teaching. That's the type of uh, awakening mind training that a teacher received from Sir Lingpa. Okay. Alexo, you, you had a, a follow-up question too about um, um, Pramana and uh, cultivating right view. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, Professor Apple, you said um, that Atisha considered Pramana basically for refuting the non-Buddhists. But, you know, obviously Tsongkhapa very much uses Pramana, and it seems like Nagarjuna does in his, um, I mean, six treaties on reasoning to establish the right view. So, I mean, if Atisha kind of rejected Pramana as a way of establishing the right view for oneself, then what, what was his method? Was it just Doha's or um, I don't understand? He was trained in Majamaka, this uh, Majamaka reasoning, a little bit that I gave, uh, this Avadutipa, as well as uh, other, uh, his, his main Majamaka teacher was uh, Vijaya Kokila and Avadutipa. And so he was trained in this lineage of Chandakirti and Nagarjuna, which doesn't rely on uh, Pramana. You know, you have to remember here, that Tsongkhapa himself was trained as a, as a monk of Songpu, Songpu Netok, right? That's where all the monks after the 13th century were trained. And so Atisha certainly was well familiar with the works of Pramana. We know that when Atisha passed away, he had works of Pramana with him uh, that were sent back, to either kept in Raithing or were sent back to India. But for whatever reason it was, in his extant works, uh, both in the such a, such a entry to the two realities, the Satcha Dwaya Avatara, also there's another longer work about uh, the uh, Mahayana Sangraha Var Mahayana Varna Sangraha. He talks about 
the futility of debate. So this debate, monastic debate culture was not uh, something that Atisha wished to train in. For this was something that, that was a development historically after the Songpu Neto uh, in the 13th century. And then Tsongkhapa himself was trained in that. Uh, and that's why Tsongkhapa developed something that most scholars uh, have still tried to work out, which is the union of Dharmakirti and Chandakirti. Uh, and, and so that... But Atisha used basic syllogisms, though, right? I mean, that's kind of what my main... I question. have not seen that. You know, there, there's a... No? There, you know, there's a famous little quote here that I included in the Illuminator, right? And... Uh, let me see if I can find it, right? Atisha, he basically says, right, you don't want to waste your time on debate and fame through, uh, you know, uh, wasting your time on debate. Rather, you want to focus on meditation. And so, um, I think this is on page, uh, Eighty-five. So here's what Atisha says about debate. Page eighty-five. Neglecting one's hard to tame, hard to tame mental stream while practicing argument in order to learn debate or engaging in the explanation of the teaching in every moment of the day and night for worldly things such as fame and so forth, life quickly passes on without purpose and one degenerates from the supreme path. So. He doesn't have much positive to say about debate. And, and that there's a couple of other quotes like this too. And, you know, it could be that, or, you know, I don't know. I don't know why uh, Tisha had this view, but he did not like debate. You know, debate is taken up by, you know, figures like Dignaga and Dharmakirti. They are not Majamakans. Okay. Atisha was trained in his youth in Majamaka from a practitioner, uh, Avidutipa, a Mahasiddha, right? Not, he wasn't trained in uh, Maha, uh, Majamaka from a, a monk living in, uh, in you know, Vrikamala Shila, right? He was trained by a tantric yogi. Also Bodhibhadra was a Majamakan and so was Vidya Kokula. And in fact, Vidya Kokula, we don't have any extent writings from, but Vidya Kokula uh, is in retreat outside of Nalanda and gives uh, teachings, uh, special uh, teachings to Atisha on Majamaka. And we know in the biographies that Atisha taught on uh, Vijaya Kokula uh, teachings on Majamaka, but they weren't preserved. But we don't have much record of Atisha giving teachings on Dignaga or Dharmakirti while he, in his 12 years in Tibet. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Venerable Gilton Licton. Uh, we have a question from Venerable Gilton Licton. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you, Professor, for coming. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, just really quickly following up on Venerable Lixok, it just seems to say that there's a distinction, especially even in the quote that you mentioned, um, about using debate as a means of gaining worldly fame and things like this, as opposed to what later happens in the monastic tradition, whereas debate is merely a tool used to learn the text more deeply. And even Sokapa says that if you say study and meditation are separate, then you're doing both of them wrong. So debate itself doesn't seem to have the same fixture in Tibetan life, as you said, they're only debating against other, Tibetan, other Buddhists as it would have in Atisha when he was actually actively debating or in a environment that was actively debating um, non-Buddhist scholars and pundits and as you said losing a debate with one of them could have dire consequences you might be forced to convert to your view or things like this so it seems a little bit um i don't want to say a straw man argument but it seems a little bit disingenuous to say that he disliked debate so much and therefore the debate that is practiced in tibetan monastic tradition especially the Gilukpa tradition is not in accord with uh, a teacher's way of studying and learning um, even if he didn't believe that pramana is still a valid means to again gain Buddhahood. So that's just an interesting distinction. Um, but what I actually wanted to ask you about was, um, you mentioned, and I read in 
Jules, even just your introduction in Jules and Little Way was quite wonderful. It was really, really uh, a joy to read that kind of scholarship. I appreciate it. Um, that for Atisha, his main opponent was the Yogacarya point of view in trying to say how this is kind of not the correct understanding of reality. Um, meanwhile, what I think Tsongkhapa and later Madhyamakas would say, especially as you said, that Atisha uh, prioritizes Baba Viveka in many ways, whereas we say Baba Viveka would be the Yogacarya Swatantrika Madhyamaka. So they're actually much closer to Yogacharyas than what we consider the ultimate Prasangika view. And so I was just wondering if you've seen in your study, in his trying to disprove the Yogacharya point of view, but upholding Bhava Viveka, who we later considered, especially in the um, non-existence of external objects, but it only being of one, how do I say, of one substance with the uh, object, the Yudu Yujini Zechigla. It just seems much more like a Sensamba point of view, actually. And so I was wondering if you have any um, any scholarship about the real distinctions that he was really fighting against with the Sensamba point of view, and how that is distinguished from the what we consider now the Nejotrupa Umarangupa, right, or the Yogacarya Swatantrika Madhyamka. So thanks. Yeah. So it, um, there's a segment in uh, Jewels of the Middle Way, right, where Atisha is questioned by Tibetan scholars in West Tibet. And he actually says, you won't, you won't, you, you will not understand uh, my mind only presentation of Majamaka, right? And so here is this, uh, what I call this Nangsang, um, Nangsam Umapa. Pratibhata, Pratibhata, was Pratibhasa Mat, Pratibhasa Matra Majamaka, mere appearance. This is not preserved. This is not preserved in present day Tibetan Drupta. Okay, there's only a couple of commentaries in Sanskrit which even have the term, but this was very prevalent in the early Kadampa manuscripts. So it's actually a very refined understanding. And here I brought this out in another article where it uh, was published in Korea. It's called Atisha and Ratnakara Shanti as Philosophical Opponents. And so if you read that article, it will clearly show that they interpret a sim the same verse of Nagarjuna's from the Yukta Shastika, Yukta Sh the 60 stanzas of reasoning, verse 34 is a very famous problematic verse. And so Atisha trans uh, understands that verse from uh, this Pratibhata Masa or Pratibhasa Matra, Matra Majamaka perspective, whereas Yoga, whereas Ratnakara Shanti presents it from Alikakara Yoga Chara, right? This uh, non true images, unreal images, Yoga Chara. Mm -hmm. And so this show, that article will show the very subtle distinction that existed at that time in India. Uh, and so that'll be a little bit different than I think than uh, what occurs later on with Sankapa. You know, Sankapa is ac accusing. Uh, Bhavi Viveka being a, uh, was it, Sanskrit is a Vastu Sat Pavadin, right? Which is a Nirpal mm -hmm. Mawa, a substantialist, yeah. right? Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's a substantialist. And so uh, I think there was another article in a, a book edited by um, Sarah McClintock on the Swatantrika Prasangika distinction, which uh, brings this out that Sankapa, you know, he, so for Sankapa to prove that Baba Viveka is this substantialist, he has to find this very subtle point that Baba Viveka makes and then bring it out and then kind of make Baba Viveka say something that's implied, but wasn't really there. And so, as I say, as actually Tupton Jimpa has said, right, Sankapa is very famous for making texts say what do, does not appear to be there. So for instance, right, the object, the Gakshan Nuzin, right? You know, this Gakshan Nuzin, right? Object and negation. Sankapa, you know, makes a whole big point of this from Shant, a verse out of Shanti Deva, which Shanti Deva himself never identified, you know, never emphasized this object and negation. But Sankapa, right, finds it there and brings it out and makes a big standpoint of it. So Sankapa, so this is what's kind of what, you know, this scholarship on Atisha has done 
you know, years ago, several Japanese scholars point this out. This how different Tsongkhapa is in his Majamaka view. It upset. I mean, it, it, whether you like Tsongkhapa or not, you have to deal with him. That's what mm -hmm. happened in history. Everybody, whether they liked him or not, had to contend with Tsongkhapa because his ideas were so revolutionary in terms of, you know, this object negation, the Majamakas have a thesis, uh, so forth, and so, you know, and his explanations of Buddhahood. And so here, Japanese scholars pointed this out, and, you know, other scholars did not always agree with that. And so here, I think that this manuscript evidence of Atisha uh, shows that. And it's, and it is, it's disturbing because we, it's a surprising and disturbing. We don't want to see something that tradition didn't know. We don't want to see something that tradition didn't hand down. Something that happened to be hidden due to the contingencies of history, right? One Mongol overlord conquered a Kagyu king and then hid all these manuscripts in the basement of Drepung Monastery for 300 years. And so then some of the greatest polymath scholars in world history, like Tukhan Turgenim, Tukhan Turgenim, and Chanke Ropadorje, and so forth, didn't have access to it. And then all of a sudden you read it, and it's like, holy smoke. You know, it, it, it's, yeah. and so it's very upsetting. Yes, it's but, totally but at, at the same time, though, those, they were hidden or lost about 200 years after Tsongkhapa passed away, right? So if we don't well, see him referencing them... Well, but or see, or Jotun J or Kedrick J, you know, referencing them, then I wonder if it's specifically because he wants to uphold Atisha as such an important figure and not contradict him at the same time. That's and right. That's why he's not referencing them, but not that yeah, he didn't so see them. For instance, though. you know, uh, I mentioned this uh, point about Tsongkhapa emphasizing ethics. This was actually mm -hmm. pointed out by another scholar, Elizabeth, Knapp, uh, Na Elizabeth Knapper. She was one of the main scholars of the trans. Uh, she wrote a very famous book, Dependent Arising mm -hmm. and Emptiness. And so she wrote this article, you know, showing that Tsongkhapa only quotes three verses. Uh, Tsongkhapa claims in the Lam Rim Chimmo, I'm relying on Atisha and the Abbey Smile Amkara, the ornament for clear realization. But he only uh, cites three verses from the Bodhipatta Pradipa in the whole 1,500 pages of Lam Rim Chimmo. So yes, he's only using Atisha to emphasize ethics and moral discipline. But he doesn't really want to talk about Atisha's Majamaka, and he doesn't want to talk about Atisha's practice of esoteric Buddhism either. I mean, that's a whole nother story uh, that I didn't yet write. But here, Sankab, uh, tracing down these lineages, you know, not only do you have this episode in the, you know, the 1600, 1642 with the fifth Dalai Lama, but you got to remember the Mongols came in. And as I mentioned, the Mongols wiped out Rating and several other Kadampa based monasteries. So these main, so the, the, these manuscripts that I'm talking about that were preserved in the Nechu Longkong, the 16 Arhat Temple in Drepung Monastery in Lhasa, they were mostly kept in Kagyu monasteries. So, you know, manuscripts, we only have copies of, you know, and they weren't, you know, Tsongkhapa's works were some of the first works that were distributed in print form that were xylograph printing technology. Otherwise, all manuscripts were hand copied. And they wouldn't, there wouldn't be that many copies that were made. And, some, and, and so what happens is, is that a lot of these manuscripts were kept by a Kagyu, a Kagyu king, a Kagyu patron king. And so Atisha himself, before the 13th century, was actually held as a Kagyupa in, in a number of paintings and so forth, right? He was a lineage holder as a Kagyupa. And so when the Mongols come, they, when they, they hit uh, Rating Monastery, we don't know what manuscripts survived. So even though mm -hmm. Jay Rinpoche Sankapa did a retreat at, 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 a, at a Rating, that was probably about 150 years after the Mongols attacked. So, so far, my research is, uh, I haven't published this yet, but I'm not so sure Sankapa himself had uh, access to some of these materials that I'm. Uh, I have, I have yet to see it. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's fascinating. And, and this is just a glimpse of why Sei Chen Ling was so excited to do this, this event.
because the work is so fresh. It, it's so amazing and mind blowing in many, many ways. Um, we have three questions. We're going to get these in. Um, we're going to start with uh, Karen. Um, we have a question from Karen. Okay, let me unmute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. I miss your faces. Wow, it's just so nice to see you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Apple. I have enjoyed it immensely, and uh, I bought your book, so it should be arriving soon. Uh, my question was regarding, you mentioned the cycle of proficiencies by Tara at the beginning, and I wonder if you can say more about that. Is this a text that's available for study? Uh, what, what is the cycle of proficiencies? Uh, the cycle of proficiencies is that was that a uh i thought you said it oh um i'm i'm sorry i don't remember it was, what? The, it was the tara cycle it was mentioned um oh you mean the site the cycle of prophetic uh prophetic text uh from prophecy yeah the cycle of prophecies regarding tara right okay so i missed i misunderstood <laughs> It's yeah, the, so, the cycle of prophecies regarding Tara, not the proficiencies. No, the, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't articulating well. The cycle, <laughs> of, cycle of prophecies in the life of Atisha. And what that, that text, that is a uh, found uh, in these Kadampa manuscripts, and it was put in the collected works of Atisha, and it's where uh, they connect each one of the prophecies in Atisha's life that he uh, received from Tara into a praise of one of the 21 forms of Tara. And then the 21 forms of Tara are given with a mantra and their colors and what, how they should be used. So what I was pointing out was, is that when you go to Natong in present day Tibet and you see the Tara chapel there, the 21 forms of Tara are all gold in one color. But and, it, and according to like, let's say earlier work, like Stephen Byer's book, he will say that the 21 forms of Tara were never really brought to Tibet by Atisha. But this Kadampa text shows that that is not the case, that this, these 21 forms of Tara were kept secret among er, a close knit group of Kadampas and they were visualized with different colors and different mantras. Thank you. Thank you very and, much. You know, that, that kind of reminds me that, you know, what, uh, what we see in all the Kadampa teachings, and this is, you know, most scholars thought this was a little bit later, but it actually occurs during Atisha's life. And that is what the Kadampas will call Lokcha or Kokcha and Sokcha. So Sokcha is teachings for a general audience. And then Kokcha is direct teachings for a close disciple. And so Atisha gave a number of teachings to a public audience and then other teachings in private, particularly at like advanced meditation teachings. And that, and that distinction, which was thought to be uh, more prominent among later Kadam and Kagyu, actually goes back to Atisha himself. Fascinating. Thank you for pro Professor Apple. Min, we're gonna go to your question now. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. You're on, man. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting talk. I actually bought your book. So hopefully when you get a chance to travel, we can uh, do a little bit of signing signature. Uh, I'm very, I was very sad to hear that Atisha wasn't offered the, uh, you know, the tenure professorship in Tibet. Otherwise, he wouldn't have like so much trouble fighting the funding and things like that. But I think uh, one of the, my uh, main question is just that, uh, Atisha has given a lot of teachings on bodhicitta. That's why you call him the illuminator of the awakening mind. He, he really loved that teaching. So I guess my question is that what really moved him so much about his teaching, right? Uh, what, what about it that really resonated with him, given that he wasn't a commoner, he wasn't like someone who had a lot of hardship, he was a prince, and he has like a very sheltered existence, if I recall correctly. And then how do we reconcile the teaching on bodhicitta with our 
more modern understanding of interpersonal relationship. For example, if you uh, if you have a friend and the friend uh, is in a marriage and where the husband is a bit abusive and you tell a friend, oh, what you need to do is to take all these abuses with like grace and dignity and you know exchange oneself for the other. That friend would not be very happy with you. I think that that would not be like a good instruction for for modern 21st century on an interpersonal relationship. So I kind of want to hear how you would reconcile these very ancient teaching on bodhicitta with our modern understanding of how interpersonal relationship is supposed to be in in the 21st century. Yes, yeah, so th thank you for buying the book and thank you for the question. Uh, here, the first part of your question, right, Atisha. Um, he hears about this altruistic intention to uh, achieve awakening from his, you know, uh, pilgrimages in Bodh Gaya and, uh, and, and Vikramala Shila. And then that's what drives him to go see this teacher. And so the teacher, Serlingpa, Dharmakirti Sri, is the one who inspires him, right, with these more advanced teachings of Bodhicitta that he had not heard before, you know, the classical altruistic Buddhist teachings these are particularly teachings that even the Dalai Lama frequently advocates, right? And so the, these teachings on bodhicitta uh, have, you know, very elementary levels, and then they're also very advanced levels. Uh, you know, the awakening mind, right, uh, has as its basis, right, the shuruna karuna garbam. It's right as the essence of emptiness and compassion. And so to have a full realization and actualization of that, it takes a great amount of effort and meditation and so forth. So a teacher goes and gets these lineage instructions, right? And, they, and they, it's what his teachers are encouraging him to do. And then once he gets caught up in those practices, he is very much encouraged, right? To develop this kind of altruistic intention uh, and benefiting others, right? As he says, right? That when one has the insight into emptiness, one will automatically, you are almost automatically be able to help others. So here with regards to your other question in modern applicability, this is where you need to go, right, and you know, consult with a you know, modern uh, Tibetan Lama or Tibetan spiritual teacher who has the lineage of, of these teachings, right? And you'll know, follow what they have to say in their advice about the applicability of these teachings in daily life. Because what, as I mentioned, the, you know, exchanges of exchanging oneself and others is actually a quite very advanced teaching, which was only given in secret among, in the Kadampas. And actually was only given much, uh, publicly much later, if even then. And so here, with regards to your second question, right? If you have a, I believe your center, right? Has a living embodied, a living Tibetan teacher, right? Who's a lineage holder. You should you know, try to get uh, these lineage teachings. And you know, one thing about a teacher, right? Is that these type teachings, uh, what very comes out in the stages of the path is that these type teachings, even basic refuge, has to be received ritually in a ritual uh, oath, right? You have to public, or not publicly, but from a teacher, an acharya, or an accomplished master, receive refuge, you know, the refuge in the three jewels, right? And then one takes uh, other types of uh, vows, of which the most heaviest and important are the monks of nuns and monks. And then after the, so Atisha actually requires, right, that one uh, uphold the oaths of refuge and bodhi, uh, these other vows, uh, Pati Moksha vows, as they're called, monastic ordination vows from lay people to monks, before one can receive bodhisattva vows, and before, even before bodhisattva vows, before one can generate the bodhicitta. So for Atisha, what it comes across is, is that you one should have solid teachings received ritually in refuge, like the three jewels of you know the Dhar Buddha Dharma and Sangha, the you know tree Ratna Saranam, or one should uh, also receive some type of lay vow, like the Panchashila, right? Of not lying, not stealing, not killing, not taking alcohol, the uh, not non uh, non sexual misconduct. You know the basics of lay or novice vows, those are the type things that one should be committed to before one engages in uh, higher meditative cultivations. And so that's what comes across in Atisha's writings is this, uh, and also it's very interesting. He places great emphasis on this upavasa, which is one day fasting ritual. And that 
See, that one day fasting ritual actually dies out in Tibet. It's no longer, pra- they don't practice it that way like Atisha does. So this is another proof that the Lam Rim, uh, this Bodhipatta or Bodhipatta Krama, the Jungchub Lamgi Rimpa by Atisha was most likely offered by an Indian because it emphasizes Upavasta, one day fasting vows, which is very important in ancient Indian culture. And still to this day in Theravada forms of Buddhism as well, other forms of you know, modern Indian Buddhism. So here, uh, your second question, right? You should uh, consult a traditional teacher and you know, receive uh, commitment in the basic teachings of you know, refuge and of other types of vows of restraint. And then you can ask about the teachings on Bodhi, the awakening mind cultivations. Thank you very much for the question, man. And thank you, Professor Apple. Very quickly, we have a question that came in from Facebook. Um, could you just speak very briefly about Um, uh, the, the person asking the question writes, I recall hearing um, that Jumtompa was a predecessor to the, the incarnation lineage that later became the Dalai Lama's lineage. Could you speak briefly to that? Yeah, Jumtompa is this great layman. He's uh, from an aristocratic family, right? Uh, it's not quite clear. Uh, there's some story, you know, like I say, his biography was just uncovered a couple of years ago, and it mainly talks about his education as a youth in eastern Tibet, and, and then who he took Upasaka vows, layperson vows from. But during uh, this has been mostly published in uh, Atisha's work, which is called the Kadam. Uh, uh, Tukin Jimpa published a work, the Book of Kadam, the Kadam Lake Bomb. And in that set of teachings, which I believe was uh, given at Yerpa, Yerpa or somewhere around that area, Atisha instructs Don Tampa on all his previous lifetimes and then connects his future lifetimes with Avalokiteshvara. And so uh, that type of connection is made. And so the Dalai Lama, right, he's the 14th Dalai Lama, but he's also the 74th incarnation of Avalokiteshvara going back to a young Brahmin boy at the time of the Buddha who offered a crystal rosary to the Buddha. And so then that young Brahmin boy take, you know, takes various rebirths. And so the Dalai Lama's life times go through, up through Jontanpa as well. And then they later become identified with disciples of Sankapa and become the Dalai Lamas. So here Jontanpa is this seminal important figure, not only in the Kadampas, but also in broader Tibetan history. Thank you so much, Professor Apple. As, as we wind down, thank you all for your questions and, and thank you for your patience. I'll, you're all still with us. So this was a very engaging uh, discussion. Professor Apple, thank you for your um, tenacity with us and your exertion with us. Um, I'm just, before I wrap up here, since we spoke about the Dalai Lamas, you know, it's my understanding from your book and from quotes that the Dalai Lama has stated before that most of us who are converts to Tibetan Buddhism and um, most Tibetan Buddhists recite the words of Atisha perhaps every day in the form of the combined verse of refuge and bodhicitta. In your book, you point out that that, that does seem to be of com- composed by Atisha himself. Could you just speak briefly on that as we end today? And I'll say thank you from my side. And when you're done, I'll have uh, Venerable Carol Karate come in to take us out. Yeah, that, that's in the uh, Illuminator, right? I can't remember where I put it. But uh, yeah, I was looking through the various you know, versions of, of the, if you find the page, let me know. I can, then I would be able to tell you the source I grabbed it from. But it, that verse, this, what is it? Sangi Chodan Tobi Chungam La, Jancha Badu Dagni Gapsuchi, Dagi Jinso Gipe Sonam Gi, Drola Penja, Sangi Drupa Show, something like this, right? That verse, is uh, actually found in two or three different works of Atisha's. And so uh, that was brought, I think, ritually and used by uh, the Tibetans and popularized. And so there's a great amount of Atisha, little things like that, right? Uh, Like his ritual recitation of the Heart Sutra too. Uh, Atisha, that was, you know, uh, Nakso Lutsawa was instructed by Atisha when he first arrived at Vikramalashila in the correct recitation of the Heart Sutra. So you have um, these little tidbits like that where uh, some little practice of ritual recitation becomes more and more popularized through the, uh, the centuries, right? 
Or like, for instance, when uh, Tisha gets in trouble or he finds another monk who's in trouble, Maitripa, right? Uh, he has to make satas, little satas, these little clay images, right? That's a practice that a teacher brought with him to Tibet. I mean, the Tibetans picked up on that as, lo- as well as uh, Tara and the recitation of the Heart Sutra and also this bo- uh, verse on bodhicitta and refuge. It's page 82. Top, for those who have the book, it's the top of page 82, I believe, Professor Apple. Yeah. Um, and so... Here, this uh, verse is, I go for refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the uh, supreme community until I attain the awakening through my practicing generosity and so forth. May I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so uh, that comes from uh, the Bodhisattva Adi Karmika Karma Marga Avatara Deshana, right? The entering the path of the beginner Bodhisattva. So, that was composed in West Tibet for the king, Zhang uh, uh for his benefit. This was one of the early, uh, you know, uh, before the before he composed the uh, lamp for the path, Atisha composed several long works uh, related to stages of the path. And one of these was how a bodhisattva should enter the path. And so that verse is found in that text. Thank you so much, Professor Apple. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Venerable Carol will take us out. So I want to thank you again, Professor Apple. I hope you will return because this has been fantastic. Thank you to everyone else who has been attending, for all of those in the Zoom room and those on Facebook. Please visit uh, Sitchin Ling's Facebook page and our uh, website at sitchinling.org for more programs coming up. Thank you.